So good morning, everyone. I am Francesco Giazzotti. I'm going to chair this session uh, for half of the morning. So let's start the session with uh, Bradford Welliver, and uh, he will talk about TES-based light detector for Cupid using a iridium platinum bilayer transition at sensor. All right. Uh, thank you. So uh, thank you for having me here, and I'm happy to be at this lovely location to talk about some uh, work we're doing developing uh, TES-based light sensors for alternatives for Cupid and uh, Cupid one ton. So just a very quick summary of motivation for all this. Uh, this application is in the area of neutrinoless double beta decay searches, uh, which uh, is a hypothetical standard model uh, process not uh, observed yet uh, that would be beyond the standard model. Uh, in which uh, you'd have two uh, neutrons convert into two protons and get just two electrons back out. So it'd be a lepton number violating process and new physics. So Quarry is currently uh, operating at Gran Sasso uh, and is uh, a ton scale cryogenic uh, bolometer experiment searching for this in tellurium dioxide and I've uh, recently just had some nice results come out uh, in nature, setting a new half-life limit for this search. Uh, but uh, we want to move beyond quarry uh, because quarry is limited due to a background uh, from degraded alphas. Uh, it only collects heat information through NTD uh, thermistors. And uh, we want to upgrade quarry into Cupid using scintillating calorimeters, in particular lithium molybdate. Uh, and this is just sort of an example of the Cupid uh, baseline goal for uh, background budget. Uh, we want to suppress all of the background by a factor of 100. And uh, there are advantages from switching isotope beyond just scintillation. It puts us into a cleaner region of the gamma spectrum. But uh, one of the largest contributing factors to the background in Cupid and Cupid beyond one ton would be two neutrino double beta decay pileup because uh, 100 molybdenum has a relatively fast half-life for this process, being like 7 times 10 to the 18 years. Uh, so the principle behind the scintillating calorimeters is you have this uh, lithium molybdate crystal. You outfit it with uh, some thermistor to read out heat information. And you couple uh, nearby a light detector of some sort, such as a germanium wafer. Uh, in this particular example from Cupid Mo, a pilot experiment uh, demonstrating this technology, uh, we used also an NTD thermistor, and you can sort of see the characteristic time scales of pulses from these. But the, uh, the basic uh, idea is that you have uh, an event in your crystal, it produces some heat information that's collected uh, from the thermometer on your crystal, and then scintillates and your light detector picks that up. And this is great because alphas have a very uh, low amount of scintillation light for a given heat energy compared to beta gammas, and so you can discriminate between these two. Uh, but uh, there are some challenges with this uh, due to the two neutrino double beta decay pileup. Uh, and in particular, uh, TESs are well suited to solve this problem. So uh, what we want to try and do is have sufficiently fast light detectors that we can uh, identify this pileup from happening uh, and tag them and reject them. So uh, besides energy threshold and resolution requirements uh, for the light detectors, uh, on the order keV detection at the Q value, which is 30, 34 uh, keV, and very uh, low threshold, you want also very good timing resolution. Uh, so for here, you want something that's roughly 150 microseconds or better, uh, depending on uh, some assumptions you make on this. And TSs uh, operate by essentially biasing some uh, superconducting material in its transition region. And you get this negative electrothermal feedback that drives the sensor uh, back to its operating point based on whatever fluctuations you have up or down this uh, curve. So they're extremely fast and stable devices. And uh, we can have really good timing resolution as well as energy resolution for these uh, devices. So uh, initially, uh, we uh, have a small collaboration between UC Berkeley Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Argonne National Lab in the US uh, to test out uh, controlling the transition temperature of these devices using the proximity effect. And so we have a superconducting metal and a normal metal sandwiched together. The normal metal suppresses the transition temperature 
of your superconducting material. And depending on the thickness of that normal metal, you can dial in uh, whatever TC that you want. So uh, spidering fabrication was done at Argonne, and we have a test facility mainly at UC Berkeley and uh, at Argonne National Lab. Initial development was using iridium platinum uh, chips that we just test for their uh, TC based on the thickness. And you can see here uh, a nice example of, uh, for a given iridium layer of 100 nanometer, going from uh, 20 nanometer platinum all the way up to 80 nanometer platinum, you can dial in a transition temperature where you want. And lower TC is nice because it improves your energy resolution and makes uh, it easier to uh, have faster sensors. Uh, so after designing the uh, chips and showing that they are a, a valid idea, we want to now see how it works as a light detector. And so we create a, uh, we, we deposit these uh, TESs onto a silicon wafer, uh, couple it to the, uh, a holder with some sapphire weak links, and there's some copper clamps here with uh, GE varnish that uh, help for both uh, stability and for adjusting the uh, strength of that link to the bath. So uh, you can remove these or add them in as you wish uh, for testing. And here's a sort of schematic uh, thermal model for this type of detector. So you start off with your bath, in this case a cryostat. You have some weak link through the sapphire to the wafer and also possibly from the copper clamps if they're there. And then you have the TES coupling to the wafer itself. Uh, these uh, TES sizes we've been experimenting with are ranging anywhere from 300 to 500 micrometer by 300 to 500 micrometer, so square, square devices. And we use uh, niobium leads to lead to bonding pads where we do aluminum wire bonding to read out. Uh, so at UC Berkeley, we have a test facility with this Oxford Triton 400 dry dilution fridge, a little old but still quite uh, reliable. And we read out using four MagnaCon uh, squids in order to amplify the small signals coming out of the transition edge sensor. And uh, one of the basic sweeps you can do is essentially an IV curve. And you can see sort of the various three regions that your sensor might live in. Uh, if you have a large uh, voltage, you can be in the normal region. Uh, then there's a superconducting region at very low applied voltages. And then the biased regions is where you want to live because there your sensor is having this negative electrothermal feedback. And uh, this is just an example of the power versus temperature curve, which gives you some information about uh, whether your sensor is completely decoupled from the, the, uh, sap, the silicon or not. So in this case, n equals 5, you have electron phonon decoupling. If it was closer to 4, you'd have some Kapitza boundary layer resistance. So one of the things we noticed right away was that with just plain iridium platinum on the silicon, our uh, pulses were quite small compared to our noise. So we engaged in this campaign to improve uh, the thermal conductivity of the TES to the sapphire. And for this, we created a test wafer with uh, different gold uh, fins, essentially, uh, sandwiching the TES in order to improve the uh, thermal conductivity to the silicon substrate. And so this is an example of the actual device here, and this is sort of a cartoon schematic to see a bit more clearly. Uh, you have the bare iridium platinum sensor here, and then uh, different size gold pads in order to try and improve this uh, thermal conductivity. And the good news is that this is a, a great uh, success. Uh, so you have a clear improvement in the thermal conductivity with the addition of these uh, gold pads. Uh, if you look just at the power versus temperature here, you can see sort of the bare IRPT, power versus temperature curve, a very low thermal conductivity. And then as you increase your uh, gold pad uh, size, your thermal conductivity really starts going up. But of course, there's a trade-off here because if you have too much gold on your sensor, you increase the uh, heat capacity and that tends to slow down your pulses. So you have to have a trade-off between uh, you know, not getting too large, but not being small enough that nothing happens. And we've sort of settled on 300 by 300 for now as a decent compromise of these two. And you can sort of see here uh, the resistance versus temperature just to look at the TC. It's roughly compatible as you add the gold in. But what's interesting is without it, you can see the bare iridium platinum has a slightly lower TC. And this is just due to heating from environmental noise. So uh, in particular, it's rather susceptible to vibrational noise. But the addition of the gold helps the TES be coupled to the bat stronger, so small little vibration fluctuations 
don't cause it to heat up as much. And so current designs, uh, we have 300 by 300 micrometer iridium platinum, uh, either with 160 nanometer iridium platinum or 4520 with these gold pads, TCs in the range of 30 to 40 millikelvin, and normal resistances of about half an ohm to an ohm. So these are low impedance devices. We've installed uh, several fiber optic cables into our cryostat in order to inject LED light into the uh, sensor in order to characterize the timing and energy resolution. So here you can kind of see the cryostat with the wafer holder and two examples of the fibers. And this is just an example of sending LED trains into your device. So you can see they're quite uh, noticeable and we can tag and uh, process these. And so to examine the timing resolution, we inject pulses with a fixed rate and we can characterize this by examination of the typical time between the pulses. Uh, we get something on the order of about 20 microsecond timing resolution uh, based on 600 nanometer light injected at 32 hertz. And this is well within the Cupid baseline requirement for uh, pileup projection. And we're also able to distinguish, importantly, pulses that are at least 150 microseconds apart, which allows for this pulse shape discrimination to occur based on pileup. So here's an example pulse, a uh, double pulse with two LEDs separated by 150 microseconds. There's clear distortion on the rising edge of your uh, light signal. Energy resolution, you can also probe how this behaves as a function of uh, LED energy injected just using photon statistics and uh, the behavior is roughly following this nice uh, standard square root of energy. Uh, if we extrapolate down our baseline resolutions on the order of 50 EV from this type of calibration, which again is uh, well within the requirements for uh, Cupid or Cupid one ton. Uh, and we're also testing anti-reflective coating in order to enhance the amount of light collected by these devices. So here's an example wafer with 68 nanometers of uh, silicon nitrite on the backside only. It's expected to have very small uh, reflectance uh, in the wavelength of interest, about half a percent. And importantly, we were wondering whether this changes the pulse shape characteristics of the device because adding on this extra material changes your heat capacity of the wafer potentially. And the good news is with and without the AR coding, uh, our pulse shape doesn't really change that much. There is a slight uh, increase in speed, but uh, this particular device also had a little bit of uh, extra noise issues uh, on this, so it might have distorted a little bit. But the energy resolution is uh, roughly compatible and still below the requirements. So uh, this seems like a promising avenue and we're exploring other uh, anti-reflective coding strategies as well. Uh, now an interesting thing also we wanted to try and get is with uh, 55 iron source to get an absolute calibration. And we noticed immediately that uh, compared to the LED events, the iron 55 has a very unexpected shape. Uh, and this is not pile up. We've looked at pulses in these uh, high tail region. They look fine. They're single pulses. Uh, their only difference is as energy goes up in this amplitude here, the uh, shape of your pulse starts getting longer and longer, and the rise time gets slightly faster. Uh, so we've started implementing some phonon simulations in G4 CMP to try and understand this. And there's some preliminary uh, work done on this uh, by one of our postdocs who has shown that uh, differences in speed with the uh, type of phonons produced and how they propagate might be able to explain some of this behavior. So this uh, kind of shows up as a position dependence in essence. Uh, if the iron uh, source is placed relatively uh, nearby the TES in terms of its geometry, then it looks more like this or like these events here in green. But if you shift more towards the edge, then this becomes narrower and more Gaussian shaped, still broader than the LED, but uh, it has a downshift in uh, the collected energy. So this is looking promising as an explanation for this and we're determining whether this is something that we want to uh, either deal with by adding more uh, TESs around the sensor to collect uh, uniformly. So maybe four of them in sort of a quadrant shape or if this uh, doesn't really matter because again, as a light sensor, we just need to have some measure of uh, discrimination for pileup between and between alpha beta. So another activity we're engaged in is scaling up for uh, Cupid and beyond. So in particular, uh, we have a lot of sensors that would be needed. If this was an alternative selected for Cupid's light detectors, we have an order of something like 3,000 or half of that uh, TES sensors. 
But more importantly, for Cupid 1 ton, which is envisioned to go beyond Cupid, you'd have something on the order of 10,000 channels, which represents quite a lot of wiring for the TES and squids. And so that's a significant heat load. Uh, however, multiplexing is common in TES devices for large scale arrays, especially, for example, in the CMB world. Uh, and frequency division multiplexing is a fairly standard thing for these devices. And we would not need a large multiplexing factor, just something on the order of 10 would save us quite a lot. So uh, we've started working on this uh, at UC Berkeley and LBL. We have a test chip with 10 resonators, uh, just uh, lithographic spiral inductors with interdigitated capacitors with small crosstalk expected. And so they're essentially flipped in the order of where a capacitor and inductor goes. Uh, the Q factor is something on the order of 100 kilohertz. And we've designed a PCB with the resonator to go at the still stage of our cryostat, so at 700 millikelvin in a magnetic shield. And also improving the connection between the TES device itself and this uh, resonator chip with squid uh, in order to reduce your parasitic stray inductance. So uh, these have arrived at UC Berkeley now, and we are getting ready for uh, test implementation in our cryostat and to see how, uh, how smoothly this goes. So uh, in conclusion, I guess I want to say the TES-based R&D program is proceeding quite nicely at UC Berkeley. Uh, we have a lot of promising results for this device. It meets the energy and timing requirements needed for something like Cupid 1 ton, which you really want to have is, uh, a really good pileup rejection for these uh, two neutrino double beta decays. Uh, so timing resolution is quite fast. And uh, further tests, we're underway. We're continuing to optimize these devices and improve studies for position, noise, and multiplexing. And so here's just an example of the test wafer again and some typical pulses. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Brad, for, for your very interesting talk. So are there any questions? Hi, good morning, very nice talk, thanks. Um, I have a question about the, the, uh, the plans for the multiplexing. Mm -hmm. uh, since the rise time is, is pretty fast, uh, uh, 20 microseconds, we might need a very large bandwidth. Yes. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, frequency spacing are you aiming for in a multiplexing? Yeah, so uh, we're going to be operating initially in the low megahertz range for the overall multiplexing signal. And since we only need something on the order of a factor of 10, you know, something spaced even 100 kilohertz apart should be sufficient. But you know, we can tune this a bit as we see what happens. Right now, our main challenge is we just want to get something that shows that we can actually operate this and verify, OK, we have the ability to produce these chips, and then we can tune in sort of an optimal spacing. But uh, yeah, we don't need anything crazy in terms of like gigahertz level frequencies. Just megahertz should be fine for now. And thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious about the uh, 150 picosecond, I think, timing uh, resolution. Microsecond. Microsecond. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Much, much different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what, what's your confidence level just in discriminating between the different pulses? I mean, it looks very subtle there, that rise time. Uh, yeah, so is it always really clean when you have a single pulse? And it's yes. Just, okay. So, yeah, admittedly, this one is not the greatest Microsoft. noise environment for this. This is just from our last run. But uh, it is rather obvious if there are more than one pulse in that rise time, because usually it is extremely just flat and straight up. So the rise times for these are uh, typically much faster, actually. It's a little interesting. This. Uh, set of new devices that we've been testing with the different uh, thickness of iridium platinum, this is I think the 4520, seems to have a factor of four slower rise time actually than our previous sensors. I might have in the uh, back up here, uh, yeah, so there, there's another type of device that we've been looking at as well with the, the different 150 nanometer. It has rise times on the order of 80 microseconds and it's a lot more clear that there can be some distortion there when you have separation. And in fact, this one is 70 microseconds apart and it's clear distortion. So uh, this particular one is admittedly just a little uh, 
different than the other ones. But we've been trying just to see if you know, we can minimize the amount of material we want so we switch to a thinner set of devices. If you know, we want to, we can go back and then the rise time should be faster again. Any other questions? Sorry, can't hear. <laughs> Sorry. The miscalibration between the LED and the iron source. Yeah. So I, I didn't, I don't get from this, let's what's. Yeah, so th this is something we're still so trying to investigate, basically. We're not 100% confident what might be the explanation. We're starting phonon simulations with uh, G4 condensed matter physics package. And preliminarily, it looks like it might be just because the iron 55 x-rays are such higher energy, the phonons that they produce and how those propagate are different than the optical photons that impact. But when you shine with the fiber, you shine with a uh, collimated spot or yes. a white? Ah, it's okay. fairly and collimated, yeah. And, and same with the iron source. It, also, the collimated. iron source is collimated. Yes. And they are f close or far? Yeah, so actually, for this particular set of data, the two were essentially side by side. And maybe with respect like to the TS, the distance? They were about, I would say, maybe five centimeters below the TES, but it's directly below. And what's so in the direction of the TES. Yeah. Okay. And so what was interesting is if we move the ion source closer to the edge, uh, we see this peak shift down in amplitude, and it becomes more Gaussian shaped again. Uh, yes, so but five centimeters is such that the optical fiber is still collimated. Uh, the sorry, iron the, the, fi the fiber is closer. The fiber is ah. closer. The iron is smaller, yeah. And it's got a really small like millimeter pinhole. Okay, th time is out, so let's thank the speaker. So, um, the next talk is about ultra low noise redoubt with traveling weight parametric amplifiers, the Dart Wars project. And the speaker is uh, Alessio Retaroli. So thank you for the introduction. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the presentation is on the Dartworth project. So Dartworth stands for uh, detector array readout for uh, with traveling wave um, traveling wave amplifiers. And uh, so I will briefly cover some motivations for the uh, development of these low noise microwave uh, detectors, actually amplifiers. And then I will uh, talk about briefly uh, some principles of operation of these devices. Um, uh, and I will, I will split into uh, Josephson devices and kinetic inductance devices. And then I will switch to some preliminary measurements and, uh, and the presentation of the Dartworth project with its main goals. So um, what's the frontier physics here? Um, in fundamental physics, uh, like in the research for dark matter, neutrinos, or CMB, or even in the quantum computing uh, field, like for the qubit readout, uh, ultra-low noise detection and amplification uh, is essential. So this, uh, this is an example plot of a, um, uh, the, the coupling constant of axions to photons uh, as a function of the axion mass, uh, that is um, what I've been working on since my master's degree thesis. And in these researches, you have, you have to, uh, to lower the, the, the noise, the, the thermal noise, and uh, you're left with the, um, only the amplifier added noise. So uh, it has to be the lowest possible. Um, so in these fields, uh, we search for weak microwave signals. 
and um, we want to, to, to build arrays of detectors, such as uh, mi um, microwave kinetic inductance detectors, or arrays of uh, transistor edge, edge sensors, or uh, microwave uh, resonant cavities, or even um, uh, qubits for the high fidelity readout uh, of, of qubits. And uh, in, th in these fields, so uh, you have to, to develop a, a device with a large bandwidth and the lowest possible noise. Um, currently, uh, the, the, the cryogenic uh, amplifiers used to read out these devices are uh, HEMS for the first two kinds, um, that are transistor uh, amplifiers, and JPAs that are Josephson parametric amplifiers for the last two uh, detectors. So what are what are the uh, pro and cons of JPAs versus HEMS? So JPAs are superconducting devices and can reach gain uh, typically uh, between uh, uh, of 20 dB, uh, while HEMS can reach 30 dB or higher. So, uh, but th this is sufficient for JPAs because they they are used as uh, pre-amplification stages, and. <coughs> Since they work on resonances, uh, they have a small instantaneous bandwidth and a small dynamic range, uh, while HEMS have a uh, large bandwidth and high dynamic range. But uh, the, the, the feature that boosts the sensitivity um, with JPAs is the noise at the standard quantum limit, while HEMS are uh, a factor of about, of about 10 or 40 uh, above the quantum limit. So uh, JPAs have uh, this main advantage. But a possible solution to reach uh, simultaneously a large bandwidth and a noise at the quantum limit is to develop traveling wave parametric amplifiers. So they are essentially transmission lines with embedded nonlinear lumped elements. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the elements are superconductive. So um, uh, if a signal travels together with the pump tone in the in the transmission line, uh, the signal th th there's energy transfer between the pump and the signal, and the signal gets amplified. Um, so this is essentially a mixing process where the parametric amplification is given by the nonlinear inductance of the superconductive elements. Uh, so. The, the goals of the, of the Dart Wars project uh, are, of course, uh, first of all, the development of these devices, these traveling wave parametric amplifiers, and we want to reach a gain of at least 20 dB, a large bandwidth in the five or uh, between 5 and 10 gigahertz, and a large, a large saturation power, uh, a noise obviously at the quantum limit, and uh, possibly reducing the, the gain ripples. Uh, as a second step, um, we want to, to demonstrate the readout with tra traveling wave amplifiers with various detectors such as MKIDs, TESIS, microwave cavities, and qubits. Um, so there are two possible uh, solutions. Uh, Dartworth uh, is um, exploring two, two solutions for the development of these devices. One is the Josephson traveling wave parametric amplifier that uses Josephson junctions uh, in the as, as uh, uh, superconductive elements in the transmission line. So the mixing process is due to the nonlinear inductance of Josephson junctions. And in this case, uh, uh, we can come up with a large bandwidth, a, um, a noise at quantum limit, but still have a small dynamic range. Uh, the second solution uh, would be a kinetic inductance traveling wave parametric amplifier that exploits the nonlinear kinetic inductance of some superconductors, such as uh, titanium, titanium nitrate or niobium titanium nitrate, because they have a sufficiently large uh, nonlinear kinetic inductance. And uh, two possible designs, uh, two, two designs are possible. One is a classical uh, co coplanar transmission waveguide, 
um, with periodic impedance loadings, but um, well, this, is, this has a, a main issue that is um, it has to be very long, uh, like one or two meters, so uh, we have problems of self-heating. So uh, another possible design is an artificial transmission line with lamp elements that will reduce self-heating. In any case, uh, these devices show large ripples on, get on the game profile. So uh, uh, among the institutions of the Dark Wars collaboration, there are some INFN sections like Mil Milano Bicocca, uh, Laboratori Nazionali di Frascati, Lecce, Salerno, TIFPA, and other uh, external institutions like FBK, INRIM uh, in Turin, uh, IBS in Korea, or and NIST in USA. Uh, so now let's switch to some uh, experimental stuff. Um, so this was a preliminary characterization of the Josephson uh, TWPA in, um, carried out at LNF. This was a device uh, built by IRIM, uh, fabricated by IRIM. And first of all, we demonstrated uh, the, um, uh, we verified uh, the tuning of the device both in the three-wave mixing and in the four-wave mixing, but we have some non-homogeneous behavior due to, to a non-homogeneous fabrication of, the Josephson, of all the Josephson junctions. Uh, anyway, we reached gains of about 30 dB uh, only for some particular frequencies, not in a, in a large bandwidth. And the noise temperature was uh, quite high uh, because we had some issues with uh, attenuators uh, at low temperatures, but this issue was solved. And so I told you that we had some non-homogeneous behavior. So um, at Milano Bicocca, uh, they tested uh, a sample of Josephson junctions to measure the, the homogeneity in the resistance of the Josephson junctions. And uh, they were fabricated by IRIM and had um, four microampere of criti critical current and a um, uh, normal re resistance of 80 ohm uh, by design. So they used a probe station that allows uh, four terminal measurements. And uh, so they reached a, um, they measured a homogeneity between five and 10%, that is quite good, but uh, they detected also position-dependent resistance, uh, so uh, there is room from, for improvement, of course. Uh, this is instead a characterization for the kinetic inductance uh, device. Uh, this was a, a niobium titanium nitrate uh, pattern into micro resonators, uh, and uh, the characterization work was carried out at FPK and TIFPA. And uh, this was essentially to measure the kinetic inductance of this material. Uh, so uh, they performed uh, transmission measurements uh, as, a, as a function of the, of the current and extracted the, the kinetic inductance as a function of the, of the current. So uh, this relation has been verified and uh, also uh, a glute uh, of uh, of what fraction of kinetic of nonlinear kinetic inductance inductance you have in this uh, material? So before I conclude, let me do some of the tightments. Uh, if you want some more detail on these topics, uh, go see the posters by uh, Matteo Borghesi. Uh, this is a poster about uh, again the Darkwood project, um, in particular uh, on the characterizations. Uh, that I have introduced to you. And then uh, the poster uh, by Danilo Labranca on the qubit project, that is quantum sensing with superconducting qubits for fundamental physics, such as, uh, for example, the research for, uh, the, the search for axions. So in conclusion, uh, traveling wave parametric amplifiers are promising candidates of quantum limited microwave amplifiers for applications both in fundamental phys physics uh, and in quantum computing. The aims of the 
uh, of the Darkworks project are the development of these uh, traveling wave parametric amplifier uh, with two solutions. One is the kinetic inductance uh, solution and one is uh, exploiting the Josephson junctions. Uh, then, as a second step, uh, Duckworth wa wants to demonstrate the, re the actual readout of devices such as TESIS, MKIDs, uh, RF cavities, or qubits. Um, we performed some pr preliminary measurements uh, at Pascati, FPK, and TIFPA, but obviously there is much room for improvement both in terms of gain and bandwidth, and new designs are being uh, are being uh, explored. So, thank you. So, thank you, Alessio, for your interesting talk. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Hi. Thanks uh, for the talk. Nice. Uh, do you understand where the ripples come from? Uh, ripples come yeah. from, I think, some phase mismatch issues. So, uh, when the pump and the signal travels into travel into the transmission line, uh, they can the phase. So, uh, a phase mismatch is, a, in a, is an issue in, in this device, and it has to be improved. Other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank the again, speaker. So let's proceed with the next talk. So uh, it's about astronomical applicability of colloidal quantum dot shore wave infrared image sensor with scalable pixel pitch down to sub two micron. The speaker is uh, Yo Hyun Kim. Excuse if the pronunciation is perfect. <laughs> Thank you. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. And good morning. Buongiorno. Uh, it's an honor to share uh, our recent uh, result with our uh, quantum dot based uh, infrared, especially short wavelengths infrared, uh, mainly 14 15 nanometer and 15 15 nanometer, uh, with uh, very scalable technology, uh, which has a pitch down to sub mic. Uh, sub to micron pitch. Uh, hope to enjoy this topic with me. So first, yeah, I am from IMAC, uh, which is dedicated for semiconductor scaling and nanoelectronics. Founded at, at this time and around 4,500 people from 97 nationalities with uh, 600 partners from industry and institute everywhere and yeah, you can see 70% of budget is from industry and you can think that IMAC is highly uh, application and technology oriented institute. So here, uh, yeah, our imager is mainly oriented, mainly designed for this kind of uh, industrial application. But 
I think that we can find some meeting point between this uh, cutting-edge science and our cutting-edge technology. Usually they are going together. So yeah, there are a lot of electrical device which are using this uh, cutting-edge nanoelectronic technology. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about imager. Then this is the uh, portfolio that iMac is dealing with. Uh, I want to talk about this thin film photodiode image sensor. Also, we have this kind of sore uh, time of flight and uh, NIR spot and burst gated pixel, this kind of very high speed uh, imaging devices and die stitching. We uh, make also uh, electron imager uh, with a very high resolution and for uh, scientific, uh, basically for uh, bioscience. And also, uh, one of the most featured uh, technique uh, we are developing is this kind of hyperspectral from uh, visible to IR that we can have. If we can uh, take an image uh, from this spectral region to that spectral region, then we can have more uh, reach of information compared to just with this wavelengths or just that wavelengths. So basically, I want to talk about uh, my uh, infrared imager. So uh, yeah, you guys very know, uh, well know about this kind of recent uh, James Webb telescope, wi uh, which make us more see through uh, the uh, that enabling us to see deep and old universe uh, less interfer interference the object between us and the object under interest and. Uh, so basically, uh, there is lots of interest about this uh, infrared imaging about this uh, celestial object. And uh, why are we using this thin film photodiode technique? This is very uh, application oriented uh, presentation, but I think, I think that this could be helpful why, why we are using this kind of uh, thin film photodiode based on quantum dot. Yes, no imager can compete with this CIS, for uh, uh, especially for visible, high maturity, high, high throughput, low cost, but no uh, IR sensitivity because of the limitation of band gap. Also with a small pixel pitch down to 0.56 micrometer uh, uh, pixel unit. And uh, the existing uh, technology is made with this uh, 3, 5, or 2, 6 compound, compound semiconductor material. Uh, it has very high maturity and also high uh, EQE, up to 80% to 90%. But uh, this is a problem with, in terms of process, which result, result in uh, low throughput because it is really hard to grow uh, high quality thin epitaxial thin film on silicon, so usually uh, this thin film is grown dye level or a very small wafer and uh, transferred onto uh, the silicon pixel uh, readout circuit. And uh, this bonding is done by indium bumping, indium bonding technique which limit the uh, scale scalability and which also limit the pixel structure underneath this uh, photo absorption layer. So we want to move on to uh, this thin film photodiode there will be many candidates could be used for uh, this uh, thin film, such as organic material or quantum dot. Here we are using quantum dot material. You can see how the simple the process would be. There is a silicon RIC. We just spin coating quantum dot onto this silicon wafer. So this is a very new technology and uh, potentially how throughput. You can see process is simple. Quantum dot is not that expensive. So we are targeting the cost uh, per, per chip from 10 uh, US dollar to 100 US dollar. Compared to this technique is almost three or two order of magnitude cheaper cost. And also it has already shown uh, this much of EQE or uh, almost comparable to this one. And actually, as you can see from the schematic, the pixel pitch could be ever scaled down. If we have better pressure node, we ha if we have better uh, design, then the pixel size could, sh could be shrink ever and ever. And also, uh, this technique does not care about the uh, pixel structure underneath. 
So we can use very simple structure, very small structure. We can use very complex, and we can add any, any, any type of uh, functionality to our uh, pixel underneath. And yeah, you can notice this is the uh, uh, wavelength coverage uh, be among this uh, photodiode material. Yeah, CMOS imager visible. This is for IR. And for, for the case quantum dot, we can cover from almost all spectral region of uh, wavelengths. How? Yeah, this is the, uh, uh, already many, uh, many of you would know that X-ray or gamma ray already could be detected by semiconductor uh, photodiode. Here we can have a uh, direct uh, photo detector scheme with our quantum dot layer because yeah, for here, uh, the usual non-ionizing radiation electron whole pair is generating for this case. Ionizing radiation, which means very hot electron is generated, this uh, making lots of electron and whole pairs. And uh, this also a sensitivity with this uh, very uh, high energy photons. And also, uh, if, if we can control the uh, thickness of uh, photodiode layer, then uh, we can also choose the uh, sensitive wavelengths of photon and coming in. So if we use some kind of uh, quantum dot which has band gap of uh, UV energy uh, level, then we would have really small dark current and also still have good sensitivity in this wavelength region. So uh, in principle, we have this ultra spectral uh, spectrability with our quantum dot. So uh, this kind of skin could be, yeah, we should try this, but this could be this kind of uh, thick film uh, for the case of high energy detection, we would need thick uh, film thickness. Uh, for this kind of technique, is already uh, has been realized in the display uh, technology. You know, there's quantum dot, QLED panel, all these kind of things. This, uh, this display is already using quantum dot with quite high uh, uh, big thickness. And they, this is done by printing method. So if we can print uh, appro appropriate thickness of film, according to uh, the wavelengths we want to see, and one by one, then we can have uh, this kind of ultra spectrality uh, in principle with, with quantum dot uh, photodiode. So from now on, I'm, I'm gonna more focus on uh, infrared because our work has been uh, focused on this infrared region. How the process is lo looking like. So we have this kind of uh, silicon RYC substrate underneath and we have this transport layer, and uh, there are two transport layer for uh, opposite charge carrier type, and there is photon absorber. This is made of uh, quantum dot. They are uh, well cross packed and you can see the TM image in, in the next slide. So uh, another merit of quantum dot is we can tune uh, the uh, peak absorption lengths by controlling size of quantum dot from uh, for the case of this non-ionizing non uh, non uh, radiation uh, from UV to IR, uh, for the case of lead surface we are using, uh, the wavelengths, the maximum wavelengths uh, that can be covered is 2.5 micron. So we can uh, customize the uh, spectrum of the uh, uh, sensible uh, wavelength region. Also, yeah, as I've told you, quantum dot doesn't care of uh, what is the pixel structure underneath, so this is also custom customizable. This is the uh, uh, basic strength with our technology. So this is the uh, uh, cross uh, cross section image. Uh, we we have a transparent electrode on top and transport layer and quantum dot and another transport layer, and under uh, we have underneath circuit. And this is the uh, uh, TEM image with uh, this quantum dot layer, which is. Uh, quite well prospected. So uh, this is showing uh, how customizable the peak absorption wavelengths is with our quantum dot device. First, we have start for started from this NIR quantum dot and now we are more focusing on this uh, 1450 and 1550 nanometer wa wavelengths because at these wavelengths we have, I, as I've told you, we have more focused on this uh, industrial application with this Wavelengths, uh, for this case, uh, 1450, we, uh, we don't have almost uh, zero very negligible uh, solar background radiation. This is good for active illumination application. And if we go to 1550, there is uh, you know, no absorption of photon with this 
uh, wavelengths uh, by water or carbon dioxide, then we can have very long, uh, longer distance sensibility. So uh, basically, we are uh, uh, we are having uh, this kind of uh, quantum dot materials. And uh, what is most featured with our uh, with uh, our institute is we have firstly shown a pixelation of photodiode layer. Uh, for the thin film photodiode, to my knowledge, there was no physical pixelation has been done, but uh, here we have developed a full wafer level and full fat processed and fully pixelated thin film photodiode technology, which is really good for uh, yeah, having better crosstalk, uh, you mean reduced crosstalk. This will be shared in this conference. So, uh, Using this kind of uh, full wafer level uh, processability and the uh, full scalability, if we go, uh, if we think about uh, the the ultimate dimension of imager, we can make a single chip in, into full wafer level. Then you can uh, think about sensor area of twenty thousand uh, square millimeter and the pixel number of uh, six gigapixel. This kind of imager is could be made. Also, we can go very small compared to uh, existing technique. So we can go very small, we can very go uh, very large, and according to application, we can change ourselves. You can sh uh, see some uh, Im imager, uh, basic imager characterization. This, uh, this is our silicon RYC, and this is our modular camera, which is uh, ready, uh, ready for our imager. And this is the uh, uh, resolution chart. You can see from five micron pixel to 1.82, you can see the uh, detailed things is uh, better observed. We are using this 3T technique because we are targeting, originally we are targeting uh, mobile application. We want to bring this IR technique into our pocket, into our daily life. Also, we, we want to see better the universe. Actually, I want to get some feedback from your side. So uh, 3T, uh, Pixel is introduced because of this mobile application because CTIA is very uh, high energy consumption and with large pixel pitch, this is less suitable for that application. Actually, 3T structure has this kind of problem, but we are also developing some fancy yeah, technique to uh, circumference uh, this problem. Uh, there are uh, uh, specific specification for our imager and uh, what, it, what could be the uh, uh, possible application with our uh, imager? If we, go, if we go with this kind of small pixel and small uh, sensing area, then we can, uh, this, our imager could be applied to this kind of CubeSat project, which has, uh, yeah, the satellite has this 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter dimension, then very small uh, chips uh, could be applied, then our imager uh, will can follow well this uh, dimension of uh, application. Also, yeah, uh, our thin film photodiode is, uh, is well developed to reduce crosstalk compared to uh, the single photodiode covers entire focal plane, plane array. So how we, how we can suppress crosstalk? First of spectral crosstalk could be uh, controlled by uh, quantum dot size because quantum dot has very uh, narrow peak absorption width so if we have uniform quantum dot size, then uh, color crosstalk could be reduced. And optical crosstalk, uh, uh, we have achieved uh, this by this full pixelation technique. Also electric crosstalk, if we use uh, high resistivity of uh, bottom transport layer, then this lateral transport is limited. Then we have seen uh, blooming is reduced. And Actually, this technology is very brand new, so there was no this kind of uh, dark run spectroscopy result before. This is first result with this, with this domain, which has shown this dark run spectroscopy. This means our technology is quite mature, it's really ready for going to uh, real industrial level. And this is the uh, example, imaging example with our uh, quantum dot uh, photodiode uh, device, this kind of uh, silicon see through and optical sunglass becomes just IR, just glasses, and also plastic, plastic see-through, and we can uh, distinguish uh, beans and pebbles, also some uh, LFI technique has been demonstrated. And this kind, already uh, these technique is quite mature. 
you can see your uh, IR image in a real time demo. This has already been shown. So uh, there are already uh, some major players in this domain. Uh, Embarian is uh, make use of photo transistor uh, quantum dot as some kind of uh, photosensitive red layer, and another solar vision system. Also, ST Micron has shown this kind of uh, wafer level processability. So I think that uh, this technology is quite close to us, and I think that uh, we, uh, this technique could help to see better the universe and all, the, uh, all these kind of things. So now we are developing this kind of uh, lead-free quantum dot and faster, quant faster transport uh, quantum dot, and we have shown this full pixelation, and this kind of modular camera is ready. So uh, our quantum dot image sensor is very scalable, and yeah, if we go to IR, then we can observe deeper and older universe. And QD image is enabled more scalable on imaging, so resulting in large pixel number, wafer level sensing area, also high resolution, and ultra spectral ability coming from quantum dot material. So uh, IMAG is doing from quantum dot synthesis to uh, imager design and deep analysis, and uh, we have been leading quantum dot imager innovation at the forefront. So we hope, I hope our technology could uh, have more impact on universe side also, uh, not even our daily life. Uh, and this is our list of publication. If you are interested in, then you can find uh, more detailed information from here. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, for your interesting talk. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, thank you for the, the nice talk. At the beginning, did I see that you, with your quantum dot, you can also go to the VUV area? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Uh, how low? Uh, you mean how, how short? Yes. Uh, down to gamma ray. If we use thicker layer of quantum dot, uh, the, uh, enough to stop the, the, this high energy photon, then we can go to gamma ray. And this could be done by some kind of printing technique, which is already realized uh, in the uh, uh, display technology. And there is already some solution company which offers X-ray imager made with this lesserified quantum dot, with this quite thicker photodiode. This is, th and uh, why the merit of this is direct uh, type of detector, which would have less dark ground or these kind of things. This is quite new technology and quite nice solution to this field, I guess. Any other questions? Yes, please. Terrific talk. Thank you very much. Um, you. Would you mind going into a little bit more detail regarding the fabrication process of your quantum dots? Fabrication. So uh, actually, you know, this is the uh, some kind of, there are, there are many, many things that are confidential, but uh, at least quantum dot is spin coated. Now other other layer they are sputtered or somehow deposit or uh, physical deposition or these kind of things they are deposited and quantum dot is spin coated yeah yeah okay. and they have shown up this full wafer level or full fab uh, processability fascinating thank, thank you very you. much thank you okay thank you I think I think that we ran already out of time so Lex <laughs> thanks to get the speaker thank you. So let's go to the next talk. It is about high resolution imaging X-ray spectrometer based on superconducting transitional sensor for astrophysics, fusion science, and particle physics. And the speaker is uh, Luciano Gottardi. Hello. Yeah. Point. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Luciano Guttardi from uh, the Netherlands Institute for uh, Space uh, Research in uh, Leiden in the Netherlands. 
So I will talk about high resolution imaging X-ray spectrometer based on a TS uh, detector for uh, astrophysics, uh, fusion science and uh, particle physics. This is work done uh, together with many people at our institute and uh, VTT in uh, Finland. Uh, large array of superconducting detector has been uh, proposed and are the baseline for many um, space uh, mission in, uh, in the planning. Uh, one is uh, uh, Athena that we'll talk about uh, in one minute an X-ray observatory, uh, that is a uh, light bird, uh, which is an uh, uh, infrared uh, um, mission uh, measuring uh, uh, with very high accuracy the polarization of uh, cosmic uh, uh, microwave background uh, to search for primordial gravitational waves emitted during the uh, uh, cosmic inflation. They will use uh, superconducting barometers. Uh, there are other missions in uh, China in the planning or in Japan uh, to measure uh, dark uh, baryon with a very high accuracy with X ray uh, spectrometer. And there is in the US uh, uh, a well, there's been a proposal for a, a very big mission uh, aiming for using uh, about 100,000 pixels uh, for an, a very large X ray uh, observatory. Uh, I, I will talk about Athena a li uh, little bit. Athena is a, uh, a large ESA mission to study the hot uh, uh, and energetic universe. It has been uh, planned to be launched uh, in the well, second half of the uh, 30th uh, from now. Uh, it will have two uh, instruments on board and one of the instruments is uh, the X-ray integral field of units where we are working on it. Uh, so it is a um, uh, cryogenic uh, spectrometer. It will uh, operate at 50 millikelvin in space, of course, and uh, it will have uh, sensitivity in the uh, energy bands uh, uh, between 200 eV up to uh, 12 kilo electron volt. And um, uh, it, uh, well, it is a unique instrument because you have the capability to do uh, very detailed imaging of objects in, 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 uh, in, uh, in space. And, uh, and uh, each of these uh, pixels from the image uh, is also, uh, will also provide a very high resolution uh, spectroscopy. So this will be a unique instrument for astronomer to study uh, all the uh, very faint objects very far away uh, in uh, space, uh, like a cluster of galaxy, uh, black holes, and they will study the dynamic and, uh, and many other interesting uh, things. So at Esson, we are uh, in, um, uh, responsible for building the focal plane assembly and uh, the, uh, the TS pixel area as a backup uh, te uh, technology. Um, well, the uh, TSS has been introdu introduced already in, uh, in the first uh, talk, so that makes my life a bit easier. But I will uh, quickly go through it. So um, the, the, the technology is based on a superconducting uh, uh, transition edge sensor. They are very sensitive, low temperature thermometers. The, the, you have a superconducting uh, layer, which is uh, well, it's it's actually a bilayer that's uh, made uh, with uh, different materials, superconducting and normal material. So you can tune the uh, critical temper very accurately around the, uh, 90 millikelvin, for example. And because uh, uh, of the very sharp transition, uh, um, they, uh, they are, uh, as I say, very sensitive to, to small variation in temperature. So you, if you are able to operate this in the transition, uh, uh, you can see that a very small change in temperature can generate a very large change in resistance which can be converted into uh, an electrical signal um, rather easily. So, um, uh, so we develop a microcalorimeter for the uh, soft X-ray band. So a thermometer is not, uh, uh, it's not the only thing that is needed. You also need an absorber to, uh, to absorb the, uh, the X-ray photons uh, coming in. And this is generally made uh, with uh, uh, gold layers and, uh, uh, and bismuth layer. Uh, strongly coupled to the uh, TSS. Um, then there is another uh, component of this uh, detector, which is the uh, silicon nitride membrane. So this uh, uh, provides a very uh, um, weak uh, thermal link to the, to the bath, which is very important uh, and can be tuned according to the, uh, the, the, the spec specification of the, uh, of the uh, application. So as you can see uh, here in this uh, formula, uh, um, the energy resolution of these devices depends on the heat capacity of the absorber, uh, the operation, uh, uh, well, the critical temperature of the TS, and the steepness of the transition. Uh, so you uh, understand from this formula that uh, going to very low temperature is essential if you aim for very high uh, energy resolution. Uh, 
uh, there is of course a bill to be paid uh, and is uh, the lower the heat capacity the lower b uh, will be the uh, the dynamic range as well so you will, uh, you have to find a good uh, trade off based on the uh, application uh, requirement um, well, they are uh, TS microcurrent are a single photon detectors. You can uh, uh, collect uh, uh, photons uh, uh, with uh, basically zero uh, uh, dark, uh, um, uh, with, well, with very very low noise, uh, and um, and you can uh, detect each uh, single photon. And uh, um, depending on the energy of, uh, of the photon, you can just ge uh, generate instantaneously. Uh, uh, a spectre like this on, uh, on the right. So the energy is proportional to the area, so you collect each photon, you do optimal filtering, uh, you make a uh, uh, and you can, uh, you can derive your uh, energy resolution. Um, so the, uh, um, uh, uh, when you have a large array of those, uh, those detectors, you can uh, make an uh, image of the source you are uh, looking at. Um, so they can be fabricated with, uh, uh, in a very large, uh, uh, large array. So here is a, a picture of one of our uh, devices. So this is a uh, one kilopixel uh, array. So you can see here, uh, these uh, small dots are the superconducting uh, TSs connected to the uh, superconducting leads to bring out uh, the signal. Um, and this picture is done before uh, depositing the absorber on top. Uh, and uh, here is the full picture at the end of the uh, of the fabrication, you can see that the absorber is uh, is uh, deposited on top on some legs like a table, and you can see here all the niobium leads going uh, underneath uh, the detectors. Uh, so we are uh, we are also working currently to scale this up for a full array uh, for for Xypho uh, that will have in total about 3,000 pixels. So here is uh, some uh, picture of the of the test we are uh, going to do, and in the end we will uh, deliver. Uh, backup detector similar to the one that is currently developed uh, at NASA Goddard for uh, as the, the main detector for uh, XIFU. Um, uh, when you have a lot of pixel, uh, you need multiplexing uh, because the, the dissipation in the in the at low temperature uh, would be too high if you have to read them out uh, each single pixel with an amplifier. So we uh, um, we developed the frequency domain multiplexing. So the idea here behind is that you uh, you move uh, your um, uh, signal bandwidth uh, uh, around the kilohertz into the megahertz uh, uh, range by coupling uh, this uh, detector with uh, uh, high Q uh, LC resonators uh, in the megahertz uh, range, and then you can uh, uh, separate then the uh, the, the information on the, on the different uh, uh, megahertz band. And you can see here the, uh, the uh, TS mod amplitude modulating uh, the, uh, uh, the frequencies. And then uh, at room temperature, you do the demodulation with uh, uh, digital electronics, and then you, and, uh, you can uh, uh, reconstruct your, uh, your uh, uh, pulse. Um, uh, if you want, uh, well, if you want to read out uh, an array like uh, uh, XIV, you will need uh, uh, roughly ar around the 100 squid channels, and each uh, each uh, squid uh, will uh, will read out simultaneously about 40 pixels. Uh, well, here is a picture how uh, the one of the our detector we we are uh, using. So we have they are enclosed into a uh, superconducting uh, shield, and here you can see the the, the focal plane. And uh, yeah, here you have the, the TS array coupled to the LC filter chip and the transformer, and you, see, uh, you have one squid reading out all the, all the, the squids. The whole uh, uh, electronics here is operating at 50 millikelvin. Um, so I don't have time to go through, uh, through all this in the, in the details, but uh, um, we have uh, uh, reached uh, quite some important milestone in the last uh, two years at Astron. Um, uh, and uh, I will quickly go uh, uh, through them uh, now. And if you have any questions, you can always uh, ask uh, uh, me at, uh, at the coffee break. Uh, but we have done a very extensive campaign to uh, understand and to study the, uh, the dependence on the performance on the, sync, uh, on the, on the size and the, and the, the geometry of the detectors, uh, which uh, results uh, in a, a, a single, p well, in a defining very uh, a, a large scale of detector from uh, uh, lower resistance and to high uh, normal resistance uh, suitable both for TDM readout and FDM uh, readout with a very high uh, energy resolution, uh, uh, single picture resolution lying uh, uh, in, the, in the ballpark of 1.5 EV at 6 kilo electro volt. Uh, we understand uh, pretty well uh, the whole noise contribution for the, the detectors. 
and um, uh, we have also developed a, a very high quality bismuth absorber on top of the, of the gold to increase the quantum efficiency of the devices and uh, uh, we are now ending up into almost 100% quantum efficiency for the soft X uh, ray, uh, range. And, uh, and finally, we have also um, uh, realized detector which are uh, uh, very um, uh, insensitive to uh, external magnetic field. This is a very important feature because uh, for the application, because external magnetic, well, do, uh, those detectors are superconductors, so they are sensitive to magnetic field. So we need a lot of shielding uh, to make sure that they, they work properly. And we have uh, actually demonstrated that our detectors are uh, uh, about three order of magnitude less sensitive to detector developed uh, 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 at NASA Goddard for uh, for Xifo and NIST uh, due to the, 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 f the fundamental reason uh, of the uh, detector, and um, and uh, we are actually recently uh, shown that we can make those detectors uh, practically insensitive to magnetic uh, field by adding some superconducting layer underneath the detectors. Um, all these uh, 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 these milestones were essential. Uh, to um, to reach uh, a, a, a very good demonstration of our uh, frequency multiplexing readout. Here you have a, an example of a, a simultaneous readout of 37 pixel with very high resolution. Uh, uh, this is the sum uh, uh, spectro with a 37 pixel with an energy resolution of 2.2 eV at the 6 kilo electron volt uh, range. I will not tell anything mo more because David has a very nice poster that can explain all the details of this uh, result. Um, if you want to put this into the perspective, uh, here is where we are. So our detector fulfills all the requirements for uh, uh, XIFU. In the 6 uh, kilo electron volt, we have uh, shown very low thermal cross stokes, uh, much below the uh, XIFU uh, requirement. Uh, very low electrical cross stoke between the pixel of the order of 10 to the minus 3. And uh, uh, if you look at this plot, this is the, the evolution of our technology as a function of uh, uh, well, the time. You can see that we... Uh, well, the, 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 the triangle, the hub triangle are, uh, are uh, our technologies. We had a very slow start and uh, the last two years we made a big jump and now we are in a very competing uh, um, place uh, with, uh, with other technology. Um, so uh, aside uh, the application in astrophysics, which are of course uh, very nice, there's a, a rising interest in using this detector uh, to uh, do plasma physics, in particular in combination with the development of fusion reactors. Um, this is because uh, uh, um, because the well uh, the, 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 the modern and future fusion reactor will uh, uh, will uh, will be um, uh, will have a, uh, uh, well the plasma will be so hot that will have a, uh, will ionize all the uh, the, uh, the tux tungsten uh, 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 which is used uh, on the wall of the tokamaks and uh, they can produce a very uh, complicated uh, ionization spectrum from tungsten and you need very high uh, resolution x-ray spectrometer to disentangle all this information so we are currently uh, um, uh, working together with the DIFFER, DIFFER is the Dutch uh, uh, Institute for Fundamental Energy Research to see how we can use uh, our TSs in combination with, uh, uh, with uh, Tokamak. Um, uh, so there are two uh, potential applications for that. One is, uh, uh, as I say, to, uh, to use it to study the very complicated uh, ionization states for high Z material use uh, for, uh, to construct the Tokamak. And uh, um, well, uh, as it happens for astrophysics, uh, as soon as you have a detector with very good resolution and you see uh, a lot of things that you have never seen before and uh, it would be very hard to understand uh, uh, what, uh, uh, and disentangle all this information. So it's very important to build setups where you can uh, control, uh, for example, in this case, the ionization state of uh, tungsten by means of, uh, of some existing uh, tokamak that produce a very well known or um, uh, 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 ionization state or by using electron beams uh, with a very, uh, so if you couple this with a very high uh, uh, resolution spectrometer, you can understand all this, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this physics and uh, build a very high accurate atomic physics database, which is essential for the future upgrade of the uh, tokamak. And of course, uh, uh, the final, the goal will be to use the, uh, this detector for the diagnostics, so that you can couple this with the, uh, with the, um, uh, with the tokamak, uh, like ITER and DEMO, and you can use uh, to, to, to understand, for example, the, or study the core, uh, 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 the temperature of the ion and electrons in the core of the tokamak, 
uh, to understand the imp uh, impurity, uh, uh, the radial profile of the uh, of the, the, the temperature and uh, and the ion flows in the tokamak. Uh, well, this is just a, a conceptual design uh, uh, that uh, that you might think of uh, of, uh, of having it. So you have the tokamak, you have a very long tube. Well, all the the radiation comes from the tokamak, including neutron. You have some mirror, like this, uh, similar to the one they use in the, in the X-ray astronomy, uh, to uh, to to deviate uh, slightly your X-ray beam so the neutron can be damped into a concrete wall, and then you get your uh, your detectors. Um, uh, another interesting application of these uh, devices is uh, to use them as a, a detector for uh, uh, f solar action. So there is a theoretical. Um, uh, 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 prediction that uh, uh, solar action are generate uh, action are generated in the sun and they can be converted into uh, x-ray uh, spectrum by uh, when they pass through a very high magnetic field uh, this is the uh, idea of a uh, of a yakso and uh, if you have a very sensitive detector here with very low back background you can uh, in principle be able to detect all this uh, this spectrum and what is very interesting for the for the uh, for the uh, for the TSS is that because you you could ac uh, once you detect them you could actually be able to uh, to study all these uh, lines which are predicted from the uh, electronic uh, uh, conversion uh, from uh, action uh, to energy and then uh, uh, so you can even do uh, solar physics on, uh, on uh, uh, interesting stuff. The important thing is that uh, those detectors needs to be uh, to have a very low uh, low background. And uh, uh, you can visit uh, uh, po David Poster on that. He will explain everything uh, what you have done with uh, zero cost uh, to see how far we can uh, uh, we can go in the background with this uh, detector. So I come to the uh, summary of my talk. So um, uh, X-ray imaging spectrometry based on uh, superconducting transition sensor are uh, reaching a very high level of maturity. They can be uh, they have very high uh, resolution. And uh, what is very nice for this detector, they have a very broad band uh, uh, potential for uh, application. They can uh, be used in an uh, experiment where you measure nothing for many, many, many uh, months and years. Uh, or they can be used in an X-ray telescope where you have uh, low, uh, low, low photons, so very faint object. But they can also be used uh, uh, in a uh, fusion plasma where you have a, a very high stream of uh, photons and you can, uh, well, you can use those detectors to to do the physics. So, thanks. So, thanks, Luciano, for your very interesting talk. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yes, please. What would be the expected uh, efficiency for 20 kV X-rays? For sorry, efficiency for 20 kV X-rays. Um, uh, yeah, this will be. Um, uh, a bit, uh, I think around the uh, 80, 90 percent. Well, actually, there is a, in the poster from uh, David. He has a has a plot where he, you can you can see the. The, how the, the roll off uh, in the quantum efficiency uh, as a function of uh, frequency. And I, I believe it's about 85. Maybe. Yeah. It depends on the thickness of the absorber. So you can also tune it to be very close to 100% if it's thick enough. Yeah, so actually, it's a, uh, so for this design, it, it, it is 80, 90%, uh, 80, but you can always make the absorber thicker. And that's the nice things of these detectors. They can be very nicely tuned for the applications. Yes, please. Can you explain a little further about the magnetic shield, uh, magnetic field rejection in the TESs? Are you putting a niobium layer underneath uh, the devices or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually what we, we have since, uh, well, magnetic field 
uh, dependency is a very important uh, issue for, for applications. So we have, uh, we have done a very simple test. So we had working devices, and then we say, well, let's try to, to damp some niobium underneath the membrane and uh, see what, what happened. And then, uh, yeah, we, we have the assumed basically that the, the detector are fully insensitive to, to magnetic field. The, um, the only issue that you might have is that uh, uh, you, so you have to be very careful when you do the first cool down. So you have to make sure that you cool down in a very zero magnetic field because you might have some uh, issue with the uh, flux stuff. But uh, so far we, yeah, we don't see a big, uh, uh, big effect of that. So that's quite interesting, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, hi, nice talk. Um, what kind of cryogenic system would you use for a TES array on Athena? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, on Athena, you, well, you cannot use dilution refrigerators. So uh, use uh, ADR magnetic uh, uh, coolers. So with uh, that you uh, you you polarize some salt pills, and then uh, and uh, the disadvantage of that is uh, that you they are not continuous uh, detectors. So you have to regenerate the uh, salt pills every. I think I believe 20 hours or something, and then, uh, and the rest is cooled down with mechanical coolers. Like, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we are running out of time, so th let's thank again the speaker. Yeah, and uh, so next talk will be about uh, the poster presentation, uh, review poster presentation, and so let me introduce uh, Walter Bombicini, and he will host uh, also the. Uh, we'll share the, the final part of, uh, of all the session. So please, uh, Walter. Thank you, <coughs> Francesco. I'm Walter Bonvicini from NFN Trieste. I will uh, chair the second half, let's say, of this, uh, of this session. And uh, I will start with the uh, poster review. We have uh, uh, nine posters, extremely interesting, all of them. So I really invite you to, uh, to take a look uh, <coughs> to them uh, during the coffee break. The first one, is uh, uh, presented by Mario Zannoni, and uh, uh, it is uh, <coughs> uh, devoted to uh, the development of a new squid controller unit for uh, um, Lightbird. Lightbird, uh, uh, as you know, uh, is a mission that is foreseen uh, to study the polarization and isotropy of a cosmic uh, microwave background which, as you know, contains uh, and uh, conveys uh, crucial information about the early stages of the universe. And uh, <coughs> the uh, core of the, uh, of the detector are TES. We have heard a lot about TES uh, during this session, so nothing to add about that. And uh, uh, this poster, this uh, contribution, um, pertains to the development of a new squid controller unit uh, that they uh, have developed. Uh, uh, to control uh, the, the squid that are coupled to these uh, TS sensors, and they will uh, uh, show results, uh, um, uh, uh, performance in terms of noise, crosstalk, bandwidth, uh, also uh, together with a thermomechanical simulation of, uh, 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 of the unit itself. So this other poster, that is background rate of X-ray ATS microcalorimeter arrays for elusive particle search experiments, is strictly connected to the last talk that we have just heard by uh, Luciano Gottardi. This is presented by uh, <coughs> Davide, Davide Vaccaro. And uh, uh, here they uh, show the results about uh, um, arrays of uh, um, titanium gold TS microcalorimeters uh, for uh, actually um, solar action search. They will show that they reach results in terms of uh, energy resolution of uh, uh, around two electron volts at uh, 5.9 keV with a background rate of uh, the order of 10 to the minus three per keV per square centimeter and per second in the one 
to key the range that, uh, as we have just heard from Luciano, is uh, uh, the expected uh, range from, uh, uh, in which uh, uh, possible um, signals from, uh, from axions, from solar axions, can be revealed by this type of, of experiments that are solar haloscopes. Uh, and closely related to that, uh, when you have large arrays uh, of, uh, of TS, for instance, of microcalorimeters, you have uh, clearly the issue of uh, reading out them by multiplexing. And so this other poster, uh, the presenter is again uh, Luciano Gottardi, deals with uh, the development strictly, strictly connected to the previous one, of course, uh, of uh, uh, um, the technique of uh, FDM, frequency domain multiplexing, for large arrays of uh, TES. And uh, uh, I think they have, uh, um, they have uh, some very, very interesting results. Uh, they will show in the poster that they uh, achieved uh, um, a multiplexed uh, um, array of 31 pixels, uh, reaching uh, 2. 14 electron volts uh, and uh, 37 pixels with a uh, uh, negligible uh, decrease, let's say, in, uh, uh, in energy resolution, which is uh, reported here. So I think it's very, very interesting uh, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, outstanding, I would say, result uh, with a multiplexing frequency of the order of few megahertz, if I, if I understood correctly. Okay, so another, um, let's say, another application uh, of uh, uh, superconducting devices to uh, space applications is Athena, the Advanced Telescope for High Energy Astrophysics. Here the poster title is First Structural Test of the Cryo AC Detector Silicon Chip for the Athena X-ray Observatory. And uh, um, here the um, focus is on the um, anti-coincidence detector that will operate in Athena at uh, 50 uh, millikelvin. Uh, the presenter is uh, Lorenzo Ferrari Barusso. The research group is composed by people from uh, INFN Genoa, University of Genoa, and uh, uh, the National Institute of uh, Astrophysics uh, in Genoa. Uh, the target, of course, uh, for, uh, as for Athena, is the X-ray detection in space. And also here, the technique used is uh, a network, a large network of uh, about 400 uh, iridium gold TS that are coupled to uh, silicon suspend suspended uh, absorbers. So these absorbers are suspended within, uh, within uh, the satellite and clearly a big issue is uh, related to the possible mechanical damage of these uh, absorbers uh, for the vibrations and shocks uh, occurring in the launch. So they will show here in this poster the first results uh, of simulations and, uh, and tests of the mechanical response of the prototype of the silicon bridges uh, that they tested with the uh, vibration mask that is provided to them by CN CNES uh, related to the uh, characteristics of the Ariane 6 uh, rocket that will be used for the launch. Okay, we have heard uh, about Dark Wars uh, from uh, Alessio Retaroli. There is, another, there is a, a poster also uh, that will uh, go into some other details about the development of these uh, traveling wave uh, amplifiers uh, following two, uh, as you heard uh, from the talk, two approaches, uh, the Joseph Josephson junctions and uh, the kinetic inductance uh, superconductors. We have heard that they aim at achieving uh, uh, 20 dB of gain uh, at the quantum limit, so with a noise temperature of less than 600 millikelvin. And the presenter, uh, the presenter is uh, Matteo Borghesi. This is a very interesting poster, and uh, not that the other were not, but this is uh, uh, about uh, the um, development and construction of a new experiment that is called the Nucleus. And uh, uh, it is about uh, uh, the study of the 
a coherent neutrino nucleon scattering. This is a, a, a process that is very well, um, very well uh, um, described theoretically by the standard model, and that was uh, only recently uh, observed for the first time. If I'm not wrong, it was in 2017 by coherent. And uh, a, a precise measurement of this, of this effect could reveal new properties of the neutrino and uh, clearly uh, open uh, some room for uh, new physics beyond the standard model. Uh, they will use a beam of uh, neutrinos coming from the Shaw B uh, reactor of, uh, in France, and uh, they will use a, a multi-target approach, which is very interesting, uh, a, a type of detector, uh, calcium tungstate, tungstate oxide for the uh, scattering detection, and aluminum oxide for background characterization. And uh, since the cross-section that they uh, aim to achieve is very, very large, they expect that a few grams of uh, these ultra-sensitive uh, sensors will be enough uh, to uh, achieve unprecedented, uh, unprecedented results. This is another very, very interesting idea. Sorry, I forgot to say that uh, the presenter of this talk is Marco Vignati, uh, of this poster, sorry. Uh, here we have uh, uh, um, a contribution related to search for uh, electron-electric dipole moment in cryogenic crystal. Uh, it's a very interesting idea, very clever in my opinion. Uh, the, presenter, the, the presenter is uh, uh, Marco Guarise. Uh, as, you, as you know, electron-electric dipo dipole moment is a, a, a model-independent probe, if you want, uh, to uh, let's say that allow to test uh, uh, properties uh, that are quite beyond uh, the energies that are reachable with, uh, with um, accelerator experiments. And so also here uh, there is uh, uh, the possibility to, uh, to, let's say, to reveal effects uh, related to new physics. They want to use uh, um, particular uh, dipolar molecules in a cryogenic uh, solid matrix of uh, of uh, neutral molecules, parahydrogen, for instance, and uh, uh, this idea is uh, uh, can open up really uh, the sensitivity uh, for uh, a measurement of the of this effect that is now uh, completely unprecedented. We heard also about uh, uh, qubit. It was mentioned uh, in the talk by uh, Alessio Rettaroli. This is uh, another experiment that is. Uh, uh, actually financed by INFN. Um, the presenter is Danilo Labranca. Here the goal is, uh, uh, let's say, to develop uh, uh, an itinerant single photon detector based on superconducting qubits. Um, the idea, let's say, is uh, to use the quantum non-demolition uh, measurement uh, to achieve low dark current rates and high sensitivity. And uh, uh, they have performed a very careful uh, simulation and design uh, uh, stage of the preparation of this, uh, of this uh, detector uh, using the QI's kit and the ANSYS uh, packages. And they will show in the poster uh, how the design of an optimized transmon superconducting qubit uh, uh, is, uh, let's say, is done and what is the stage of the development of such, uh, of such a device. Finally, the last poster is presented by Irene Nutini. Uh, the research group is from uh, University of Milano Bicocca and INFN. Uh, Irene Nutini is on behalf of the CORE collaboration and uh, uh, the title is Novel Techniques for Thermal Detectors and Application for Rare Event Physics. They will show, they will show in, the, in this poster new ideas, new, uh, let's say, uh, developments uh, to uh, improve uh, both the uh, light collection uh, by developing uh, a novel cryogenic light detector with plastics wrapped 
around uh, the crystal uh, to, to, to read out the scintillating light uh, in order to, um, uh, in order to uh, let's say, uh, improve the background rejection and the separation of the alpha from uh, beta gamma signals and also uh, improving the thermal con uh, detector sensitivity so that they are acting on both, on both uh, uh, let's say, uh, directions, um, the thermal detector sensitivity and the improvement of light collection uh, by using NTD-based uh, scintillating calorimeters uh, with, as I said, double readout of heat and scintillating light. Um, they will show how uh, these uh, first uh, uh, results that they, that they achieved uh, seems to improve, really improve the sensitivity of the thermal detector and of the light collection. So this was the last uh, uh, poster uh, for our session. They are, as I said, uh, they are all extremely interesting. Uh, I think we can now uh, go to the coffee break. We will reconvene uh, at 10.30, right? But please take the opportunity also to take a visit and have a look to these very interesting, very interesting contributions. Thank you.
Please uh, take your seat. Okay. It's better, it's better. Questa spada ladra è avanti indietro. Grazie. Sono, sono all set. Would you please uh, take your seat? We are going to uh, start, uh, restart the session for the last two talks. Sì, sì, facciamo sedere tutti. Perché? Ah. Mm -hmm. dal 2017 sì, sì. dal okay. 19 dal 19 Okay, so um, the next talk is f by uh, Marco Vignati, Sapienza University and NFN, and he will talk uh, uh, about the Bullkit project. Okay, thank you. So, just the mic. So, Bullkit is uh, an R&D project to develop detectors for this process, which is the elastic scattering of elementary particles of atomic nuclei. What happens is that when, when the particle impinge on the nucleus, uh, it transfers to it part of its kinetic energy, then it goes off, and what we can observe is the kinetic energy of the nuclear recoil. So this process is used since a long time to detect dark matter particles, and the next frontier is to explore particles with mass below 1 JV. And the other application is the neutrino coherent and elastic scattering of atomic nuclei, nuclei, which is a process discovered only five years ago, which is proposed to make precision tests of the standard model and to search for physics behind it, and also to monitor the activity of a nuclear power plant from safe distances because of the high number of neutrinos that they can they emit in the in the nuclear combustion so uh, dark matter or neutrino interaction are weak interaction therefore we have a very small cross section and therefore we need a large number of targets and at the same time the target nuclei to enhance the cross section usually are also heavy nuclei and therefore the kinetic energy which is transferred to them is very small, so usually below one kV. So one needs uh, a detector that at the same time is large and also very sensitive, and the problem is that it is difficult, of course, to have both these features in the same experiment. Indeed, in this uh, uh, graph, I list the present experiment as a function of the energy threshold which ranges from uh, 10 electron volts up to some kV and as a function of the target mass which again ranges from a fraction of grams to kilograms and uh, uh, as, as one can see why we have that ionization detector usually easily reach high masses however they do not reach low threshold and they are basically intrinsically limited so this technology is almost at its uh, best performances now while cryogenic detectors, phonon detectors, can reach uh, very small energy threshold below 100 electron volts down to levels of a few tens of electron volts, but the target mass is very small. So this is because uh, uh, scaling up the cryogenic technology is difficult. Of course, uh, the detector R&D points into this direction, so detectors at the same time have small energy threshold and high target mass, and with Bulkid, we want to invest on the cryogenic detectors because this is where you can reach the lowest energy threshold, replacing the current sensors, which are transitional sensors that we already heard about, and uh, uh, NTDs with the kinetic inductance detectors. 
So uh, briefly, what is a, a kid? So uh, a kid consists of a superconductor cooled well below its transition temperature, its transition temperature such that all electrons are bound into Cooper pairs. When energy is absorbed in a, a superconductor, this energy can break the pairs and change the intrinsic inductance of the superconductor, the kinetic inductance. The, for the idea behind the kid is to insert the superconductor in a high quality factor resonance circuit such that when energy is released, an inductance change, change give rise to a measurable change of the resonant frequency of the resonator. So with the Calder project, we pioneered the, this technology and we realized the light detector based on kits and we reached energy threshold of 125 electron volts. And with Bullkid, we port this technology from the light detection to the detection of nuclear recoils. So the team is composed mainly by researchers from INFN and Savienza and the collaboration with the, uh, the NEL Institute and CNR for the fabrication of the devices. So uh, the foundations of BULSI is to start from a target, a target for neutrinos and dark matter, which has to be small because we want sensitive detectors. So the idea is to have a cube of a five millimeter uh, side of silicon, which corresponds to a fraction of gram mass. When uh, energy is released in uh, the silicon, this energy is converted to phonons, which is scattered in the lattice until they reach the kid, which is deposited on the top of the cube, break the Cooper pairs and uh, generate a signal. So. Uh, I told you before that we want to reach kilogram scale. So, of course, if we, this is uh, our single detector unit, then we need uh, up to, we need thousands of this unit because we need it to reach, say, one kilogram. So, and this is why we choose the kits because uh, kinetic inductance detectors uh, feature naturally the capability of being multiplexed. And, uh, and how this can be achieved is shown in this picture. The idea is that we coupled to the same transmission line, several resonator, and uh, we, uh, by changing the pattern of the capacitor or the inductor of the circuit, we change the resonant frequency of every resonator such that we can identify them. So with this technique uh, in astrophysical application, thousands of sensors have been coupled to the same uh, feed line. Then once, okay, so kids, uh, uh, naturally solve the problem of uh, reading uh, several sensors, but then there is the problem on how to deploy such a large number of dices, so absorbers. So, and this is the original idea behind Bullkit. The idea is to uh, have a wafer, a wafer, standard wafer of three inches from the silicon industry, which usually are, are 500 microns thick. In this case, we ask for very thick wafers, so five millimeter thick. In this way, we have a, a large absorber mass. And uh, what we do, and this is done at INFN Ferrara, so we carve grooves in the silicon such that we uh, uh, create uh, all these dices. The grooves, however, are not complete so because th and they leave an intact surface of a half, mi half millimeter thick that uh, holds the dice together so that this is a unique monolithic structure. And on the opposite side of this uh, wafer. So we flip this wafer and then on this intact surface, we create uh, the lithography with the multiplexed uh, array of kits such that uh, each kit sends uh, a single dice. Then the detector is uh, assembled in its uh, copper holder. And as you see here, these are the RF connectors. So input and output, only one line. And uh, I don't know if you can spot it, but uh, here you can see the feed line that runs through all the resonators that are coupled to the same feed line. So with this technique, we created 60 detector at once. So this is the basic idea on how to obtain a large number of detectors. So then the uh, detector is uh, assembled in our cryostat uh, in, our, uh, in our lab in Rome in its uh, aluminum case. And we have a 
uh, up to eight optical fibers for the uh, calibration of the detectors, which are excited by a room temperature LED uh, of 400 nanometers wavelength. We shine light on the back of the cubes, so because uh, on this side we have the kits, and we want to simulate uh, a signal of an interactive particle. Otherwise, if we would have light directly on the kits, this would, uh, would be a different signal. So uh, this uh, uh, is, in one case, the worst situation, because we are simulating an interaction that uh, happens very far from the sensor. So uh, we had the first, so after, say, two or three years of R&D on the creation of this new type of device, we uh, had the first working prototype uh, in September. And what you can see is this is the frequency scan of the array, so meaning that we, uh, this is the uh, transmission past the array of the uh, radio frequency as a function of the frequency. And as you see, each dip uh, is a single kit. And uh, here you see many kits, and uh, we were happy by these results because uh, we were able to observe uh, pulses uh, from the kit, meaning that we measured interacting particles. However, we had a quite poor uniformity across the array of the resonators and a low quality factor, which uh, were one order of magnitude lower than we expected. We by design uh, expected uh, quality factors of the order 10 to the 5 or larger. So uh, this month we uh, produced a second prototype in which we uh, reduced the uh, electrical cross-talk between the kits and this was achieved increasing the fre frequency spacing from uh, 1 uh, megahertz in the first prototype to 2 megahertz in the second prototype. And we also improved the quality of the superconducting aluminum film by uh, um, improving the etching of the wafer surface on which the film is deposited. And as you can see, so this is, this is the frequency scan of the first prototype. This is the frequency scan of the second prototype, which visibly uh, improves because we have many more kits. With basically, we uh, measured all the kits in the, in, in the line, and they the, the resonances are all deep, and this is an indication of the high quality of the uh, resonators. So with this second prototype, we improved significantly the electrical response of the array. And then we started uh, taking data, and we have this, uh, what is also nice about kits that you can uh, uh, buy commercial software-defined radio electronics that is... Uh, uh, ready to work and also quite cheap. So with a single board, we can uh, multiplex up to uh, 60 sensors. So we do a frequency scan of the resonator. We sit at the resonant frequency. And then we monitor the real and imaginary part of the wave uh, transmitted past the resonator. And basically, our signal is this phase change here. So we measure a phase change of the wave transmitted past the resonator. This is a phase pulse uh, following an energy release of about 1 kV. So you see that we already s are very sensitive because uh, you can spot the signal to noise ratio of a 1 kV pulse. We do, uh, uh, with our optical fiber, uh, an energy calibration, again uh, scanning uh, with uh, uh, controlled uh, um, burst of photons. This, has been, uh, this technique is now widely used and has been explained also in a talk before, so I will not go through this. And uh, so uh, this is our preliminary results. So this is our matrix, and this, is a s this color map indicates the quality factor of the resonators. The majority of them is uh, uh, above 10 to the 5. Some of them is still below 10 to the 5, so we have to fix that. And we had eight optical fiber. Two of them were not working, unfortunately and two of them were facing low quality factor resonators. Therefore, we restricted the analysis to these four uh, resonators for this first uh, cool down. And uh, we obtained a very good results because we obtain, obtain a baseline fluctuation of around 20, 25 electron volts, which would convert to an energy threshold of around 120 electron volts. So 
We are now cooling back down this detector because with uh, an X-ray source to check, cross-check this optical calibration because still we, before saying that this is our performance, we want to check uh, these results. And we moved the, our, eight, our six fibers because, because two was, were broken on other resonators to, mo to start to map uh, the entire array. So uh, uh, that is now proved that this can work and also quite well. So now by the end of 2020, the objective is to have the full array working with the uniform quality factors and uh, so uniform energy threshold. And then we will have to scale up to the uh, experiment, meaning moving to the kilogram scale and uh, possibly also lowering the energy threshold. To move to the kilogram scales, we already started thinking to this. The plan is to move from three inches to four inches wafer to host more dices. And uh, uh, once we have a, a prototype, we are satisfied. The idea is to pile up several wafers to reach the target mass. We're already, wor we're already working on this assembly. What you can see here is the piling up of uh, two uh, um, copper holders made with uh, uh, a 3D printer of copper. And uh, then the other activity is uh, to lower the threshold because, of course, the lower the better always. And with this, we have several ongoing R&Ds uh, on different superconductors, different uh, kit geometry, and also on the wafer uh, uh, grooves because what you can see here is that these grooves are meant that we do to do these dices to focus the phonons on the kit. But, of course, we have the wafers, the, the, the surface that... Uh, uh, that is left intact that acts as phonon channel to and we lose phonons through this channel. Therefore, the idea is to, ma to make deeper grooves to for a better focusing of the phonons on the kit, so higher signal to noise ratio. But of course, the structure becomes more fragile. So we have to we are working on this problem. And uh, finally, uh, if, if we have the time and the capabilities, we intend to port also this technology, not only. Uh, to silicon wafers, but also to germanium wafers because of the uh, 10 times higher uh, cross-section on neutrino because uh, germanium uh, is a heavier nucleus. This does not apply to dark matter, but could, be, could, make, a different, uh, could make the difference in a neutrino experiment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marco, for this very interesting talk. Congratulations for the progresses. We have time for a few questions. Over there. Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, um, I, if I understand correctly, uh, kids are still, in terms of timing and energy, thresholds, so low thresholds, a little bit inferior to TESIS and Germanium Absolutely. Uh, NTDs, uh, but they are better scalable to large. Is this the, uh, do you think you can improve on the, uh, on the first two items and reach? So, uh, I, so, we, so the, the point is that I would say the record is represented by TESS. And uh, I don't think that in the short term, uh, we could reach the sensitivity of TSS. What I can say is that with this r and I would say that uh, we are aiming at an improvement of a factor of two or a factor of three that would be, in any case, very large. But uh, yes, we would be already very happy with an experiment of one kilogram and uh, 50 electron volts uh, energy threshold compared to experiments with uh, tens of grams and uh, maybe 10 electron volts energy threshold. So yes, but the, this is the message. So kids are not as sensitive as TSS, but the scale up is much easier. Okay, another question here. Uh, I found very interesting your presentation. Uh, I have a simple question. Uh, increasing the carvings, you reduce the thickness. Yes. Okay, which is very important to reduce. Uh, what is preventing you for leaving only uh, 
100 microns instead of 500 microns. And the problem is that... I, I don't think there is any mechanical reason. Well, so in this R&D, we experienced uh, several times uh, the, the, the broken wafers. Because when we, the problem is that when we, so we start from a, uh, from a wafer and then we do these carvings and with blades, this is done with, sure. uh, with blades that uh, very gentle because it takes ar uh, around uh, two days to do all the, because it's very soft and gentle because we do not want to break the lattice. But this damage a bit the lattice and the structure becomes a bit fragile. Yes, uh, and, uh, and yes, now this is... Uh, <laughs> we, we will try, we, we would like to. And there is also one thing that at some point, so silicon, when, so silicon wafers which are thin, like uh, 200 microns, are also elastic. And this would be a problem in terms of noise, because then inside the cryostat, where we have a lot of vibrations, this would make the, 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 the wafer vibrate. And, uh, but yes, in any case, our plan is to try deeper carvings. OK, we have time for a last question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Very nice talk. Thank I, uh, you. Uh, I miss how many uh, detectors do you need in the end for the final uh, experiment? It's something like uh, 2,000 or something uh, like that. You, you From 1,000 to 3,000, yeah. it depends on the... But, uh, so you, you stack them in, a, in wafers with 100 detectors per wafer or something mm -hmm. like that? Even more, because four inches you can put more. So now yeah. we have this, as you can see, we have this corona that is not instrumented. And this is all, was only for the first prototype. But uh, yes, we have a gain from instrumenting this corona and then by enlarging you, you can reach 150 or 200 dices per wafer. Yep. So the plan is to have from 10 to 20 piled up wafers yep. to reach the, this will depend on uh, how many dices we will fit in a wafer. Yeah, interesting. And is uh, uh, dry etching not an option for the, for the group? We do it, no. so oh, dry, okay. we already do it because oh. when we when we do the so with the, the dicing blades damage the the surface of this, and then we do etching of this oh. so the surfaces to 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 have a an, an optical reflection reflection, which means that also phonons will be optical will be completely reflected, so that we they go to the kid. Okay, I think we can. Uh, Thank the speaker again. And we, we move to the last talk of the session. Michael Nimak, Cornell University. The talk uh, will be about uh, superconducting detector arrays for cosmic microwave background measurements. Should I just switch to this one? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's fine. All right, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers. It's great to be here. Uh, and really interesting conference uh, so far. So yeah, I'm Michael Nemec, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about a few of the different projects we're working on, working towards improved cosmic microwave background measurements. Uh, and. Uh, just as a brief overview of the science that we're going after here, 
right? We're measuring this leftover light from the Big Bang, this cosmic microwave background, and in particular focusing on these anisotropies because, as has been mentioned earlier, these primary cosmic microwave background anisotropies contain signatures of a variety of early universe physics. Uh, and just a little historical background on the three satellite projects, uh, three, uh, yeah, these, the three satellite projects that have measured the anisotropies well are COBE, WMAP, and Planck. And uh, in th these cases, right, we're measuring the difference in temperature as a function of angular separation on the sky and just decomposing it into these spherical harmonic functions uh, like a Fourier transform, and then plotting the power on the y-axis, which is in units of microkelvin squared here, versus a multipole moment, or the L parameter in the y-LMs. That's uh, just roughly the inverse of the angular scale. And it's these data, combined with other observations like supernova, uh, acceleration measurements, uh, and other astrophysical measurements, that really fit this six-parameter lambda CDM concordance cosmology model extremely well, which is really rem remarkable because we have thousands of data points in here, although they're binned into smaller data points in this WMAP uh, plot here. But just six parameters are able to explain this huge wealth of data. And so now, with the current CMB survey research moving beyond uh, these great satellite observatories, uh, we're looking at the same plot, but now expanding it to logarithmic scale and spanning eight orders of magnitude instead of this linear scale plot for the WMAP data. Uh, we can see the temperature power spectrum up the top still, the E-mode polarization power spectrum here. This is a curl-free component of the linear polarization on the sky, as well as this B-mode component, uh, this divergence-free component of the polarization measurements on the sky uh, that's so far from gravitational lensing of the E-modes uh, converting them into B-modes. And so here we can see measurements from Planck and Black, uh, just exquisite measurements spanning the whole sky in these large scales here, uh, as well as some of the current ground-based observatories, uh, two in the Atacama, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, the Simons Array, or Polar Bear uh, project, the Bicep Keck effort with smaller aperture telescopes, and the South Pole Telescope uh, as well. And uh, so, you know, there's, the data are clearly improving. We're getting out to smaller angular scales and Planck and pushing down into this B-mode spectrum, uh, making a lot of progress here. But we really want to go a couple orders of magnitude further. And you can see these gray bars are this forecast for a CMB S4, uh, this next generation cosmic microwave background observatory uh, that has, you know, tiny bins and tiny uncertainties on these power spectra. Uh, which is motivated by a wide variety of different science goals we can pursue with improved CMB measurements. Uh, one of the things we were beginning to weigh on uh, with uh, better measurements right now from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope is improved constraints on the Hubble constant. It's a, an exciting area because of the tension between cosmic microwave background and uh, late universe supernova measurements. Uh, there's also potential to search for signatures of light, light relic particles in the early universe because they change the energy density at very early times and affect the power spectra at small angular scales here at high multiples. Uh, and then the possibility of seeing signals of early dark energy if it exists. Um, measurements of cosmic structure via the gravitational lensing signal. And one of the goals that's really driving a lot of progress in our field is searching for the signal from inflationary gravity waves at large angular scales, which would be a smoking gun of inflation and probe physics at extremely high energy scales. Uh, so, okay, back to detectors. Uh, just to highlight where, an example of where we are, I'll show some of uh, the devices we are currently observing with on the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Uh, and there's collaboration institutions uh, at the bottom here. And so there's our six meter aperture telescope in Chile uh, that reflects light off a primary mirror and secondary mirror down into this uh, meter scale receiver. 
Uh, and so the, that light is separated into three different optical paths that each focus down onto cryogenic detector arrays in the back. Uh, and so these detector arrays are actually coupled with feed horns, so the light comes in from the telescope, uh, focused by refractive optics that I didn't go into, but down through each of these little approximately conical shaped feed horns. Uh, and it's really the, these technologies that are enabling uh, progress in our field, combined with advances in optics and others, of course, too. Uh, but just looking at the scaling of uh, the semiconductor and superconducting detector arrays, I don't have uh, quite, I need to update this a little bit further to add a few more projects, I think. But this is uh, submillimeter and uh, CMB projects from 1990 up through current day, and that array is one of three arrays we have deployed on ACT here, where we have number of detectors here in time uh, on the x-axis, and we're working towards these upcoming deployments on Simons Observatory and CCAP Prime, then eventually uh, CMBS4 uh, in this decade. Uh, so. Right, zooming in to one of those feed horns and looking down the throat of it, you can see some of the superconducting structures at the bottom. Uh, and so if we look at one of those detector wafers, uh, this little circle is what resides behind each of the feed horns. And we have these fins that separate out the two different linear polarizations. Uh, and then there's a variety of structures. This is all niobium, the majority of what you see here, uh, that it goes from these fins into coplanar waveguide and then superconducting microstrip. And there's these other structures that are resonant features that actually define what light or frequency of light that we allow through to the detectors off on the sides. Uh, and so, you know, it's a different, very different coupling technique than what we've been hearing about uh, so far where we're really collecting this radiation into the superconductor itself and then actually depositing it onto, now this is where it gets a lot more similar to some of the TESs we were hearing about earlier, depositing it onto this thermally isolated uh, membrane so that it's been etched away from behind and the light actually comes in on the microstrip here and then uh, travels through this gold microstrip and the gold just acts as a resistor that converts it to heat and then it's measured by this transition edge sensor uh, in the middle of that membrane here. And we've already had great introductions to TESs so I won't go into any detail here uh, but right just we're operating them on the superconducting transition that's very sensitive to changes in temperature and and we're just, instead of measuring individual photons, another difference from the earlier talks, uh, we're really measuring the bulk power changes of many, many photons at once, causing tiny shifts in temperature over time as we scan the telescope across the sky. So we're deploying thousands of these devices, and uh, again, we really need a an efficient low temperature current readout system. So we use squids as our low temperature amplifiers and then we need to multiplex them. Uh, and so we're working on two different uh, multiplexing techniques right now uh, that are similar to, well one of them similar to some of the things we heard earlier although up at higher frequencies. Uh, but these squid multiplexing techniques are really critical for advancing these large uh, detector arrays. And so there's different signal mo modulation approaches. One is this time division multiplexing where we just turn squids on sequentially in time. Uh, and that's actually what we're using with that ACT array I was showing earlier, uh, that where we've deployed around 6,000 detectors and are observing with them now. And this is a very mature approach, uh, so when thinking about risk for future projects, it's often an appealing one to select uh, and it has been selected recently. We'll see if this 
uh, selection holds, but for the CMBS4 project that aims to deploy over uh, half a million detectors, so you know, almost 100 times more than we have on ACT now uh, in around 2030. Uh, but in the meanwhile, we're also developing alternative readout approaches, for, like for the Simons Observatory, where we're working in the frequency domain, frequency division multiplexing, uh, similar to kinetic conductance detectors and the megahertz frequency division multiplexing that was described earlier. Although here we're actually uh, still biasing the TESs with uh, DC currents and then just modulating the squid frequencies to read them out. Uh, and so we're building arrays right now for the Simons Observatory that should start observing with them uh, next year. So just to expand briefly on these two different technologies and readout approaches, um, so here is the back of one of those arrays that I showed for the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And so the hexagon in the middle uh, is just the rear side of all those transition edge sensors. Uh, and then what we did for ACT, since we had space inside the cryostat, was surround that array with all of the different multiplexing chips, the squids, that we need to read out those 2,000 detectors. Uh, and then there's bias resistors on these circuit boards and uh, a variety of other components. Uh, and that whole system is being cooled down to around 0.1 Kelvin. Uh, so that's working really well, but for CMBS4, we need to actually deploy many arrays side by side in hexagonal close packing formation, so we can't afford to have all this space for readout around the perimeter of each one. So there's been a lot of work going on to fold the readout using superconducting flexible circuitry down here uh, and fold it up behind the detector arrays. So similar squids and uh, other readout components will all be attached back there. Uh, now, I mentioned for Simon's Observatory, Right, we're using this gigahertz frequency division multiplexing uh, that looks schematically somewhat similar to what was shown earlier, except as I mentioned, we have these DC current driven squid, or driven TESs, sorry, and then uh, RF squid that's just inductively coupled to the TES. Uh, and then the, each RF squid is connected to a resonator and a transmission line like this. So in uh, Heather McCarrick's paper from last year, we presented the performance of one of these detector arrays uh, that uses two uh, different lines to read out almost, well, around 1,800 detectors. So this, I guess I mentioned here, I, I don't know if I remember to mention, with ACT we have a 64 times multiplexing factor with these uh, gigahertz squids, we have now an over 900 times multiplexing factor. Uh, and so this is really appealing because we can just use fewer cables as we want to deploy more and more detectors uh, in our cryostats to read out, you know, a couple thousand detectors per array. array. Uh, and this, so this is a lot fewer wires than time division, although the focal plane integration is still pretty complicated. Uh, and so here's just a schematic of all the different layers. These are different chips, squid multiplexing chips, uh, detector arrays down here, and different silicon layers that go into assembling one of these detector arrays. Uh, but it's coming along well, and we have a number of detector arrays ready to go, and we'll be deploying them starting next year in one of the small aperture telescopes, followed by the large aperture telescope, uh, six meter aperture telescope, uh, building it up over the next couple of years. So I won't go into any detail about kids because we've had a great introduction to them already uh, about how they're naturally multiplexable. And I just want to highlight that for the last project I'll mention, we're really taking advantage of the, the fact that 
we can deploy many more kinetic inductance detectors at the shorter wavelengths we're trying to measure below one millimeter for the CCAT prime project with around 100 times fewer wire bonds, so much simpler focal plane integration uh, than we have with the TESs here. And so just very briefly, uh, this is now our baseline technology for CCAT prime. Uh, this is an another new telescope that we're building in Chile. Uh, identical design to the Simons Observatory, but optimized for shorter wavelengths. And uh, we're working towards an instrument that we'll have uh, as we upgrade it over the, year, over the next few years, over 100,000 kids uh, in it. And so here's just a photo of our first array. The second and third arrays are now in fabrication, and we're, we'll be deploying about uh, 15 of these arrays at different combinations of wavelengths over the next few years. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, a lot of progress is being made just to highlight the telescopes are actually being fabricated and test builds are going on in Duisburg, Germany, uh, just north of here. Uh, and so this is just a few weeks ago. There I am waving from inside the truss structure. That's the bottom structure of the telescope. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, these feed horn coupled transition edge sensors are really working great for CMB measurements uh, and achieving background limiter performance on ACT and uh, other ground-based observatories. But we really need more detectors to improve CMB measurements. So Simon's observatory is, has chosen this gigahertz frequency division readout and will start deploying in 2023. Uh, CMBS4 will be using time division squid readout with deployment plan around 2030. Uh, and then we're pursuing kinetic inductance detectors for these shorter wavelength measurements with CCAT prime uh, and uh, aiming for first light in 2024. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for this really beautiful talk. Thank you. We have uh, now time for two or three questions. Uh, now this also works. Now this also works. Okay. Okay. So please, questions. Yes. So you didn't mention you just measure one frequency per channel or you have uh, some dichroicity or you have dichroic pixels or whatever? Yeah, great question. So, th and it's actually different for the different technologies, but I had to go through uh, quickly. With these, with the kinetic inductance detectors, the current technology is just do one frequency per channel and we're actually using optical filters to define that frequency range. So it's still, you know, a bandwidth of somewhere between, depending on the band, 10 to 30 percent bandwidth uh, per channel. But then with, so say, you know, for the one millimeter wavelength band, it's maybe between 1 to 1.2 millimeters or so. Looking back at these ones, these are multi croak detectors where we're actually measuring uh, with the TESs, where we're measuring two different frequencies, both 90 gigahertz and 150 gigahertz, with reasonably wide bandwidth uh, across uh, in one feed horn. And so that's why there's four different TESs around the perimeter uh, that are measuring the two polarizations and two different fre frequencies simultaneously. Yes, we have a couple of questions more. Luciano and uh Hi, Mark. Next talk. What is the quantum efficiency of the of the kids detect? Is it comparable to the TSS at that wavelength? Great question. Uh, the so the absorption efficiency. I don't have a plot for the kids in the talk here. Uh, well, for the TESs for this design, we should be multiplying the red curve and each of the 
color, other colored curves here. Uh, so that comes in around 90%. With the kid designs we're working with now, it's a little bit lower. It's around between 80 to 85% or so. So it's a bit lower. Uh, and uh, you know there will be challenges with trying to scale these uh, as far as we aim to. But since we can deploy or we can build uh, around twice as many detectors at one millimeter per array than we can with TESs with, you know, 40 wire bonds instead of 20,000 wire bonds. Uh, we think that the gains will be sufficient, but it remains to be proven on the sky. Um, there's a couple of current projects that we're looking at closely, like the Toltec project on the uh, LMT telescope in Mexico that should be making some of the first uh, progress with really similar technology. I mean, the, the NECA project, too, of course, is really leading the way in terms of getting kids on the sky um, so far. So that's been encouraging. We have another question here. Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks for your, for your talk. And uh, maybe I missed something, but uh, could you comment on uh, the typical energy resolution and resolving power of your sensing element? Yeah, great question. So the, the difference here, though, with these devices is we're, uh, we're really focusing on this broadband measurement. Uh, so I don't have an energy resolution to quote because what we really care about is the noise equivalent temperature. Uh, the NETs of the devices as the temperature from the photons, the you know, net power from the photons from the sky changes over time. And we're, we're, so we're sampling these much slower. In many ways, our job is easier than the microcalorimeter work because we only need to measure these devices fast enough to account for uh, scanning across you know, so the angular resolution element on the sky, which means a few hundred hertz sampling rates instead of the microcalorimeters where you want single photon energy resolution. Uh, and you need to be reading out 10 to 100 times faster to characterize that pulse. OK, thank you. OK, so there are no more questions for, for the speaker. So I would like to thank, thank uh, all the speakers of the session uh, again for the, all their contributions. <laughs> and uh, I think Francesco now will uh, uh, give us some uh, uh, information about how to proceed with the morning. OK, thank you very much. Um, so this, this uh, concludes the um, uh, session on cryogenic uh, devices and superconducting devices. And now the rest of the morning is uh, a little bit of mixed. Uh, we've, we first have a talk uh, on that as actually belongs to the uh, electronics DAQ and data handling session. But uh, we felt that it would uh, fit better here. This is uh, a talk on computing, which we don't really cover in this uh, conference a lot but uh, it's also a very important part of our work, so it, what, uh, we, we, we felt it was uh, good to have a you know, perspective. And then uh, after that, we have uh, uh, the talk from the ICFA Hour D, uh, Claudia Nones. Uh, the second talk from Velcro Radica will be at the end of the session on Friday. And then after that, uh, we will have uh, the um, awards of the uh, Mencione Prize, and it will be a little ceremony and. Uh, announcement of, uh, of uh, the people who received the prize. So now I give the floor to Tomas. So please you. go ahead. Is it working? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. Hope you can hear me. So thanks, Francesco. I said that this is probably something different from what uh, you have heard at this conference right now. I hope it will not be too boring for you. So just a few, in a few minutes, which is a very small amount of time, I wanted to speak about the landscape and the future as we know it for computing and energy physics, at least in the next decade. So first of all, let's be very clear. We are not computer scientists. We don't care about building computing system or distributed computing system because we like it. It just turns out that when 
once upon a time you needed a logbook and maybe a camera to do frontier physics. It's not the case anymore, unfortunately. You have either to go towards high energy or rare processes or very precise measurements. And they would say that unfortunate consequence of all of these is that lots of computing is needed. Just to give you an example from the current LHC, how you consequentially go to the level where you need uh, a lot of computing. This is one of the standard plots in the pre-LHC era, which era. This was used to model LHC and experiments, if you want. You have the cross-section for some interesting and less interesting processes. From that, uh, you can decide, for example, that if you want to build uh, an experiment and the collider, which tells the, the final word of the standard um, model X boson, you need this to explore this kind of cross-sections. Then all is pretty consequential. You decide how many events you need in order to claim uh, the discovery or to veto it, uh, and this is the kind of integrated luminosity you need. You decide in how many years you want to collect it. I mean, uh, you don't want to have 50 years on the same experiments if you can avoid, and this gives you a number for the instantaneous luminosity. And uh, all these basically gets you the size of the events that you have to consider to generate, analyze, store, and so. This is the, if you want, the sweet point for LHC, some uh, thousand billions event generated in these five years, and more uh, frightening if you want, uh, one billion events per second to be analyzed. That's fine. Now, these events have to go somewhere, and this uh, is the system beyond the detectors themselves. You can abstract uh, current high detec big detectors like CMS and datas, for example, with a standard uh, electronic device, let's say a camera. The detectors, you, if you want to model them, they, you could model them as a 100 megapixel uh, camera, which is not so much by today. The problem is that you take pictures at 40 megahertz. So every 25 nanosecond, you take this 100 megapixel image. And this gets you directly into enormous numbers, four petabyte per second of outgoing data, and uh, 120 zettabytes in five years. Zettabyte is probably the last unit of measurement, the last prefix in the international system. We are probably to, to move higher if we want to go beyond. Clearly, you cannot do this. The, the world is not producing enough storage for, for this, uh, simply. So you have trigger systems, zero suppression systems. I'm not going into them now. The only message is that at some point, the output of all these reduction system is uh, limited by the amount of computing you can do. So in principle, if you could enlarge by factor 10 the computing, if you could afford it, you could change the triggering system, save more events, and be more precise, and have more uh, uh, physics space available. The sweet point for LHC is uh, this kind of numbers, which uh, I'm not telling the story now, but this uh, started uh, the grid business, uh, the production of, uh, and the construction of more than 200 computing centers in the world, and so on and so on. If you want, yep. The message here is that it's not Computing has become as complex, as expensive, and needs planning at the same level of the big detector component, for example, a tracker, which is not the case up to now. In short, well, I don't need to convince you that it's, it's working. At least it's working up to the level where we need it now. So if uh, something is working, why break it? Why change it? Let's look in the perspective for the next years. What is going to happen? There are basically two trends which need to be considered. One is uh, the increase in needs. Increase in needs comes from bigger, more precise experiments, more energy, more uh, better ideas, for example, and algorithms. This increase the computing, and somehow, more importantly, they increase the money needed. On the other side, technology gets better and cheaper. The same task can be performed with less money if you wait uh, long enough. So it's not even clear we have a problem. The problem comes from uh, the tension between those two trends. So if the first one wins, yes, we probably have a problem. If the second wins, uh, we probably don't. So let's see which is the expected scenario. So here on the left, I put some of the experiments which are possibly going online in the next 20, 25 years. So if we look at uh, the closest one, which is the Illuminati LHC, on paper it has uh, six times uh, larger event complexity, and uh, you want to save uh, 10 times higher trigger rates, which gives you directly at least a factor 60 more computing needed in just seven years from now. So you have to prepare such a system for the early 30s. Dune and SKA are completely different uh, uh, scientific domains, but in the end, the numbers are quite similar. So they, they are in the shadow of Illuminosity, let's see. If you go even farther in time, so in the 40s or in the 50s, we can possibly have leptons of 
and the others con ladder from next generation. Here the, the, the feeling is that the lepton con ladders are not really a problem because the event sizes are small. For large future hadron colliders, you may have problems. So rates will be comparable with the luminosity of LHC, but uh, event size is probably a factor 10 more or even more. So this is how the needs in increase. How do the um, technology help you? How does the technology help you? Yeah. Well, this is a, a procurement plot from CERN, price for CPU from 2005 to 2025 or whatever. You can see there are a few phases in that. You don't look at the scale, you, you don't care. Just look at the relative behavior and keep in mind that the scale is logarithmic here. So you have a first phase at the start of the century where prices were going down very fast. So sort of 40% per year, which means every two years you get a factor two less for the same computing. Then it started slowing down. Then it, it even reversed the, the, the behavior and nobody can tell you from now on, nobody, I mean, has any hope that it will get back to this, uh, to this level and 15%, 20% per year is the best you can, uh, you can imagine. So if you take a 15% per year and you project it over the seven years, which are from now to LHC, this gives you a factor 2.5. So this is the size of a problem. You get 2.5 from technology, but you need 60 times more. So the problem is a factor 20, 30 around this. On the other end, if you go 25 years in the future, where I probably think that this uh, extrapolation is no more valid. Well, you get another factor 10, which tells you that probably the biggest hurdle in the community is Illuminosity LHC. If you are able to do it, then the rest, at least if modeled in this way, shouldn't be dramatic. So what, do, what can we do here? What do we do? Clearly, there is a very simple solution. You go to the funding agency and tell us, give us 20 times more money for computing. Uh, I'm not putting any absolute number for computing because they are very scary here. So I can tell you <laughs> after the coffee if you want, but this is unfeasible, completely impossible. So what you need uh, is a few, I would say, research and development plan, and there are many uh, experiments, foundations, uh, uh, European projects looking into that, and try to see which are the solutions which you can try to put on the table. And the, in the next five minutes, I will try at least to sketch one uh, per, per category. You can change the infrastructure, the way you buy computing and you handle computing. You can change the technology, try something cheaper, cheaper than our computers, uh, our PCs we buy today. You can change the way you do physics. Well, you can reduce the physics, but it's not really a solution. It's just the last, uh, the last effort if nothing else works. Or you can try to do something more modern, and um, I will probably go over that uh, quite fast. So here on the right, these are the centers dedicated to energy physics processing in Italy today. All the other countries are roughly the same. All these centers are owned by universities or research institutions. They have a long lifetime. They are perfectly balanced in storage CPU with what we need, with our requests. And the funding agency is paid for everything, resource, infrastructure, and uh, personnel. Is this the most economic computing you can do? Well, yes and no. Uh, if you care about your data, you probably don't want to, to get your data and give it to Alibaba. This is probably cheaper than having the data yourself, but then you have no guarantee that data will be back. And in the end, the data is the real result from the experiments, is the value of the experiments. For CPUs, the, the thing is completely different. Once you have computed, you have run a job on a CPU, there is no more value left on that CPU. So you can use CPUs which are not in your control. And the other message is try to have try to find the cheapest possible solution for CPUs. So go around and ask everyone in the academic, commercial, industrial world who is going to give you some resources. This uh, is at the basis of the uh, data lake model. Data lake model, the idea here is that for data, you want to keep the real value of your experiments, the data in your hands, in your in own sites, few of them. If you connect them very well at the terabit level or, or similar, you also <coughs> uh, can have uh, fewer copies of the data because you don't need one copy per data set per continent, which is roughly the way we are, we are operating now. Once you have done that, you simply go and search on the market the cheapest GPUs uh, you can find, which can be your centers. They can come and go. You don't need the commitment for 10 years. You can ask other sciences to, to help you. You can go to supercomputers. You can eventually even ask uh, Google and Amazon to give you grants uh, in the case uh, uh, they are available. So uh, one important ingredient here, as we saw, is to find cheap, uh, cheap, um, cheap CPUs. And HPC centers 
basically for us, these are the supercomputers, are free for our use. They are free because of, well, because of many reasons, but the biggest reason is that they are built uh, for some real use cases, but on the other end, they are also built for industrial showcase. A country wants to show that it's able to deploy a very powerful computer, and then maybe it's not used 100%. If we are able to use a fraction of these guys, and this is very complex because they have problems in data access, accelerator technologies, uh, environment, we could be able to solve a part of the processing problem of LHC. For example, the, the generation of computers which is coming out this year, we are at the exaflops per system. Ex one exaflop is 10 to the team floating point operation per second. And just the back of the envelope uh, calculation tells you that one exaflop could process the full Illuminosity LHC without any change in modeling. If you could get one of these beasts, they cost a couple billion dollars, so they are not going to give you very, very easily. This would be a good part of the solution. Together with this, you have the problem of technology changes, because as I said, we don't control much uh, what gets into this, uh, this system. And in any case, uh, you want to try, uh, as a general rule, to move to the cheapest computing you can find uh, in a given period. Up to now, we were lucky because Linux PCs were indeed the cheapest and most, uh, and most um, pre uh, present on the market devices in the last 15 years. It's not the case anymore. These are the shipment of device uh, in the last five years. And uh, you see that mobile chips, these are telephone, basically, they are much more uh, <coughs> deployed in the market than our Linux PCs. So this is where competition goes and where clearly money goes uh, and uh, you can expect more money to, uh, <coughs> the, the price to go down. Uh, GPUs, uh, uh, down to FPGAs and ASIC. The problem here is we have large code bases, up to 10 million line of code per experiment, and you clearly cannot afford to rewrite your code for the new technology once uh, a year, for example. So where the, the community is going to is to try to have frameworks in which you are forward looking, uh, you prepare code which is going to be able to run uh, efficiently in the, next, uh, uh, in the next systems. And here, just for example, this is from Alice. This shows that a single GPU can take the place of 300 CPU cores, which is really good result. Uh, just another two things and then uh, I'm done. Uh, you need to change analysis models. There are many ways uh, in which we'll do it. I just picked one. Right now, we just send jobs to the grid. Every job does an event loop and analyzes an event and tells you I like it or I don't, and then puts it in his histogram. This is very inefficient on standard and um, uh, current CPU systems because they have very good vector engines which are not used by this kind of computations. So there is a lot of effort in trying to move from our standard event loop to techniques which are more common in Google and Facebook. So these are the techniques to handle exabyte or petabyte sized databases. And clearly, we are trying, for example, to build analysis facilities which can work at megahertz level per system, which is really a lot given the number of events we have. Machine learning is another big beast. Uh, I think by now everyone is convinced that this will be useful. Machine learning has a couple of good aspects. If you want, the, the, the most important one for us is that usually it's faster than standard algorithms. On top of this, it can also work in most of the cases in fixed time response, which means that you can deploy them with the system at trigger level, for example. They seem to be adequate for sample simulation, interpretation, and analysis, and they are GPU friendly by construction, which is another important point because this solves the problem of porting the code, for example. You don't need to port your code. Just to give you an example, just flashing a few images, it seems a good candidate for substituting some pieces of giant in a much faster way it can uh, reproduce, at, at least reproduce the performance of Kalman filter, human written Kalman filter, with the factor 1000 in speed, uh, if you deploy this on uh, GPU systems, and uh, can increase the performance of classical algorithms. For example, CMS could go a factor six better in rejection and bitagging using the same features, just plugging them in machine learning. I wanted to have just a picture here, um, but I didn't in the end because this is really takes half an hour each. These are the directions of the system which are probably not going to help Illuminosity LHC, but are going to come for the next generation of experiments. For example, in memory computing uses the memory to process stuff while it streams, not using the CPU. Neuri buffer chips uh, and uh, FPGAs uh, and CPUs on the same package, silicon, are going to deploy more power locally if you are able to use them. And clearly, quantum computing would deserve a couple of hours of, uh, of description. So I just left the link here. So this is my last real slide. 
if I was supposed to scare you, to scare you uh, well, I hope I did, because the situation is not so easy. But let's inject some optimism, because it's not that we realize today that the computing of idomidosin LHC will be a problem. The R&D started at least five years ago. And by plugging in the system uh, f a few of the things we just said, and unfortunately the fact that uh, illuminosity will be later, this is a, a big game, game for computing because the more you wait, the less computing uh, costs. Uh, these are the last two public plots from Atlas and CMS, and uh, the, key note is, uh, the key message is that whatever sits uh, in those two exponential has an hope of being budget natural, which means that you can probably afford it. And this is without cutting on physics. So I think we are going in going into the good direction. And I have a conclusion slide. I don't want to read it. I mean, it's already things I said. Just uh, I want to tell you that whatever money you put now is going to spare you at least 10 times more when you build the experiment. Or can be the difference between I can do an experiment or not. So it's not wasted money. And uh, this thing should continue. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much, Tommaso, for this uh, inspiring talk. Um, questions, comments, over there in the back. Thanks for this uh, interesting talk. Um, I, I have a few uh, comments. So you only mentioned the uh, CPU resources required for um, working on the data that we actually take, but usually we need the similar amount, if not even much more MC data that need to be produced on the first site, which takes yeah. a lot of CPU time and analyzed. And often we need to um, rerun the full process with each calibration improvement. So it's not only that we need to You're work on the data right. once, but several times, and that will increase the cost even way more. I and the uh, storage. Indeed, I had uh, a slide on this, but the time is what it is. Uh, so basically, what you're, all you're saying is somehow condensed uh, here. The CPU needs, in the end, scale with the data size you get. This includes the number of Monte Carlo events you have to reprocess. And uh, the number of reprocessing steps instead scales more with your understanding of detector environment. So the hope, uh, when, you, when you go to the projections I put in the last slide, are that uh, by some uh, years after the high luminosity LHC start, you will understand uh, enough uh, the, the environment to limit down the number of processes, which is what is happening now. But you're right, I should have had the slide on that. There was no time, I just put a line which was <laughs> including all of that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, another question over there. Yeah, thanks for the excellent talk. Um, I think this is a good motivation, for, especially for the young people, to do something in this respect. But maybe I can give you the, pos uh, the opportunity to scare us even more. So you said on your slide nine or so that the computing power required for, H uh, for HLSC will be like 60 times more. But yep. okay, it will be somehow eaten up by the price decrease and also by better CPUs. But I guess the power consumption will not decrease. So yep. I mean, so we will also likely require more cooling. So I guess like factor of 100 more power consumption. How will you bring this in agreement with uh, arguments like sustainability <coughs> and motivation towards society and funding agencies? So clearly, well, this is a problem which is very relevant in this very moment, if you want, because the power costs are climbing up. But in principle, due to the CO2 footprint or whatever, they, they are in any case important. One of the steps uh, is, for example, trying to move to uh, to lower power computing and the second there are two things which are, are probably going to help and we are trying to to go to go over in the end uh, oh my god okay okay look at this system this is a uh, this is one of the reasons to go to mobile uh, low power systems not only because they're going to cost less uh, but the measurements we did is that they are costing uh, as at running time one fourth uh, of our standard chips so you basically divide by four the power cost and uh, at the same time the cooling needs and the, and the CO2 footprint. GPUs, well, they consume a lot, but they are so powerful that in the end, if you do the ratio, as I said here, they can substitute up to 300 CPU cores. So even if they consume a lot, in the end, the uh, power per task uh, is, is not so, so problematic. There are, there are GPUs which are uh, able to give you a, a better footprint. Clearly, and I don't know if you want to consider this a joke or what, there is a solution which would dramatically cut 
your power consumption by thousands, and this, this guy over here. Because in principle, a standard computing system today is uh, 10 kilowatts. So if uh, we expect that at some point this technology will be relevant, uh, we are probably seeing the solution uh, first hand. Uh, I don't want to go into the direction of saying uh, if I believe in it or not, this is personal opinion, everyone can make itself. But this as this, uh, if you want, side product, which would be really important, not only for us, for the whole uh, uh, planet probably. One last question or comments, Francesco. <clears throat> Thanks for your interesting talk. So, um, it, my question is just related to your last statement about uh, quantum computing. Okay, so, uh, but going beyond quantum computing, I mean, there are some uh, computational schemes, uh, digital computational schemes based, uh, on, for instance, on uh, superconducting flux quantum devices. Okay, so. Uh, very fast superconducting computer that can uh, approach, let's say, the, the, the terahertz regime in terms of uh, CPU speed. Mm. And with uh, a power consumption, typically it is uh, uh, by including the, uh, the, the power to cool the system around four orders of magnitude smaller than, uh, than other systems. So can you comment on... Uh, on what you envision using this uh, digital superconducting computer, but classical, to perform what you are saying? So, clearly, uh, we haven't seen them yet. That, that's the real, uh, I mean, uh, in our laboratory, so it's very difficult to say. But in principle, we assume, I can assume that this will be on par of quantum computing, good for accelerating stuff, more than running full work so on that. So it really depends on your ability to offload a big part of the computation over, uh, over these guys. Uh, Maybe we should talk later, because uh, I really want to understand more about this subject. Sorry okay. if the answer is not complete. Yeah, I think this is a good point to, Thank you for uh, to close the discussion. Thank you very much again, Tommaso. <laughs> and now I call uh, Claudia Nones, uh, who will uh, uh, present, yes. Uh, let's see, this. Uh, well, yeah, the disinfection. <laughs> So yeah, the, we, on Monday we had uh, the announcement of the ICFA Awards and the ICFA uh, Instrumentation Awards, and the awardees have uh, the honor, have a plaque, have some monetary compensation, but they have you know, the obligation to give us a talk <laughs> on, uh, uh, on uh, the, their research so that uh, we can all learn more uh, about uh, interesting areas. So yeah. Yeah, Claudia will uh, will talk about bolometers, uh, which is a you know in a, a huge area of research that has uh, provided already a lot of interesting results, and it's uh, a very promising area for the future. And uh, this should be your yes. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank again uh, the ICFA panel to award me with this uh, early career award uh, prize. And it's an honor to be here to speak about bolometers as powerful tools to search for real events. So this is the outline of the talk. I will start introducing you how a bolometer works. And then uh, what happens if uh, we add some extra channels beside uh, phonons. And then I will spend the last part of the talk showing you why bolometers are important and have uh, attractive features for rare event uh, experiment with three emblematic cases uh, at different uh, development stage, such as Cupid Molybdenum, Cross, uh, and Bingo. So let's see what is a bolometer. So a bolometer is a rather simple device in which you have uh, a crystal coupled to a thermometer. Everything is kept at a cryogenic temperature of the order of 10 millik. And uh, usually we have two types of uh, possible event. Self-contained event like a neutrino less double beta decay or external event like the one presented by Marco in the previous talk uh, in which you have energy deposited by the scattering of the particle in your crystal. So the, the goal of this kind of uh, measurement is that the energy that is deposited is read with your thermometer and you have an increase of the temperature of the systems thanks to the production of phonons. 
from a naive uh, model, you can say that you, we can say that uh, the increase in the temperature is equal to the ratio between the deposited energy and the heat capacity of the system. So we have already heard this morning about several uh, types of uh, thermometers. So let's see how it works. So at the beginning, when there is the release energy inside uh, the, the absorber, you have phonons that we call a thermal phonon, characterized by energy of the order of few milli electron volt. Then, and for this kind of uh, regime, we have what we call the a-thermal phonon sensor, like TS, that have been already extensively presented in the previous session. Then you have an energy down conversion cascade that leads the thermal phonon to become thermal one, and uh, their, their energy comes to microelectron volt uh, regime. And in that, in that case, uh, what we usually employ are neutron transmutation doped uh, thermistor, so germanium that you doped, uh, for which it is uh, the resistance that change at uh, low temperature, but we can also have MMC that are um, metallic magnetic calorimeters that are read uh, with squid. So, but let's see how the absorber has to be chosen. So the crystal that is, for some cases, the source and also the target for the, your physics. So usually we use dielectric diaminated single crystal or superconducting absorber. We have this choice because in this case, only the lattice contributes to the heat capacity. And in macrobolometers for astroparticle, the, the typical range is much bigger than what has been presented before, so we can go up to one kilogram of material. And the signal that we look for, for NTD readout, is of the order of one point millik per MeV that is deposited in the crystal, so you see why we need to stay at 10 millik, otherwise there is no way to see your signal. The main advantages are the high energy resolution, the low energy threshold, and the high efficiency and the versatility in the choice of the material. And here on the picture, you can see uh, the single module of Quare that is running uh, in Grand Sasso using tellurium dioxide crystal looking for neutrino as double beta decay of tellurium 130. But we can have hybrid bolometers. So in addition to the phonon signal, we can add extra channels, and we will see why it is important to go in this direction. So I will start from a uh, chart. The main idea and this is rather simple. You put electrodes on the top of your crystal, which in this case is a semiconductor, either silicon or germanium, and you apply a few volts. What happens is that you have a charge readout that is uh, added to the phonon one, and this is an excellent method that has been used uh, and is still used for uh, to discriminate nuclear recoils from electron recoils, having a lot of application in dark matter searching and the coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. Why we go in this direction? Because nuclear recoils, for instance, like the one of WIMPs, that is the signal that we are looking for, produce less charge to respect to the same energy electron that is uh, deposited by beta and gamma. So if you have a scatter plot in which you have the charge as a function of the deposited energy, you can disentangle the two population, and this will allow you the suppression of the background. And this has been implemented by the Edelweiss 3 collaboration. Here you have an example of a germanium crystal of 800 grams in, in which you can appreciate the NTD and the concentric electrodes for the readout of the um, charge. But we can uh, do better, and we can increase the applied uh, voltage to our electrodes and go up to 100 of volts. In this case, what happens is that the charge that are created, they drift in the lettering field, creating an extra heat that we call the neganoff trofimov leuka effect. And in this case, we speak about phonon-mediated voltage assistant measurement of the charge. This is important because uh, you have here the formula that connects you the heat under the bias of the negative fluke bias that is connected, connected to the standard heat, so the one generated by phonons, plus this extra heat induced by the high voltage that you applied. And in this way, it is possible really to go down in the threshold of your detector. Here you see the energy spectrum that has been obtained again by Edelweiss in the low mass campaign using TS niobium silicon sensor with high impedance, so not the standard TS. And you see that you can appreciate the three uh, shell uh, uh, of the um, activation of germanium 77. And also the same, uh, the single electron hole pair sensitivity has been also achieved by super CDMS, uh, again with TS uh, readout. But we can also change uh, 
the chart with a light signal. It means that in that case, the absorber, in addition to be a standard barometer, is also a scintillator, and usually there is the emission in the visible light. But this can be also a Cherenk of radiator, like in case of tellurium dioxide. The issue here is that in addition to the heat, you have also the production of uh, light. And I would like to stress that in this case, we are not reading the light with silicon PM or photomultipliers. We have again a second additional bolometer. So you have a germanium or a silicon wafers, like the one that Brad presented this morning, which you put again another thermometer, and you read in coincidence the heat and the light. And again, uh, this double readout find application in dark matter search and in neutrino less uh, double beta decay. Why again we do this? Because uh, in, this, in uh, this case, uh, if you have light versus heat, uh, so before it was um, charge versus heat, here you have light versus heat, again, you can disentangle population. For instance, alphas and nuclear recoils emit in general a different amount of light. So, Alphas that are uh, one of the most dangerous background for neutrino less double beta decay can be completely suppressed with this uh, double technique of readout. And here you can see the results that we have obtained in Canfranc using a calcium tungstate uh, crystal. So I hope uh, to convince you that bolometers are uh, well, well suited for experiment in astroparticle and neutrino physics implying often the source for rare events in extremely low radioactivity and low background environment. For that, we go underground and we use heavily shielding cryogenic infrastructure. There are uh, several properties that are connected to the physics case that we want to study, so low mass dark matter or axions, coherent elastic neutrinos, nucleus scattering, and neutrino less double beta decay. So, the first property is low threshold. This is really important in the first uh, two cases, uh, low mass, uh, dark matter, and coherence, uh, coherent neutrino scattering. And again, here you see the low threshold that has been uh, reached by Edelweiss 30 electron uh, volt uh, threshold with the 30 gram germanium absorber exploding the neganov luke assisted uh, process. High energy resolution is really important on the contrary for neutrino less double beta decay because we are looking for a peak, so it's important to disentangle the peak for the background that you are facing. And here we have really recent uh, results that have been uh, achieved uh, in Canfranc in the cross facility, where we have obtained 5 kV full width of maximum at the thallium line for a, a standard cupid-like uh, lithium molybdate uh, crystal. Then uh, we need to speak about radio purity. It's rather uh, easy, but also important to obtain it with uh, barometers. We need to focus our process of crystallization which is by itself a purification method for uh, uh, this kind of uh, devices. And then usually we couple crystal to copper, which is intrinsically a pure material. And uh, radio purity is important and relevant for all uh, this kind of uh, application. And then the material flexibility, because uh, in some way you can do bolometers with uh, whatever material you want uh, to choose. Uh, you will uh, see which is the best suit for this kind of application. So here I put pictures on some experiment at which I work in the last uh, 15 years. So you have uh, Edelweiss with germanium, Crest with calcium tungstate, and then we have uh, uh, all the, the parts related to neutrino less double beta decay, so zinc molybdate, lithium molybdate, calcium tungstate, and then recently we have developed lithium tungstate for the coherent scattering, and then quarry with tellurium dioxide and zinc selenide for Lucifer and Cupid Zero. And then uh, one other advantage of this technique uh, is the high efficiency. And this is really important for neutrino, especially for neutrino less double beta decay. And thanks to bolometers, you have the source equal to the detector approach in which you really have the full volume available for your uh, study. And last uh, but not least, we can also exploit for this kind of uh, detectors, uh, the detector technology and the microphysics for background control. And this will be the case that I will show you in uh, the next part of the talk uh, related to the cross project in which we are exploiting really the phonon physics and the solid state physics at uh, low temperature, uh, cryogenic temperature. So as you have understood, the key issue is the background control. There are several sources uh, that are uh, the standard one, cosmic muons and neutrons, and for which we go underground. We check all the radio purity for all the elements that are in the cryostat, and we use a high passive shield. 
But then we have a uh, gamma, alphas, and betas from the environment, and then electron recoils, especially for dark matter. And as it was pointed out by Brad, we have the two new uh, for neutrino less double beta decay, that is, uh, especially for ramolybdenum 100, is an important background that we have to face. So here I have just listed some options uh, and some uh, ideas that we had in the last years to face all this kind of uh, background. I will not go into the details. Uh, you can uh, have a look after to the slide. And now I will move uh, to three projects uh, so in which I have uh, contributed mainly. So Cupid Molybdenum, which was a successful story, then Cross, uh, which is nowadays uh, a promising R&D, and then uh, I will go to Bingo, which is a recent uh, ERC that I got uh, one year ago, which has the challenges for the future. So the common denominator for all these uh, three pro projects here is neutrino less double beta decay in molybdenum 100 and tellurium 130. As you have heard this morning, neutrino less double beta decay is a rare decay, nuclear decay, not foreseen by the standard model, and uh, with bolometers, we adopt the source to equal detector approach in which the source uh, that are uh, these two isotopes is embedded in this uh, kind of crystal. And uh, as I told you before, we look for a peak at 2.5 MeV in case of tellurium 130 and 3 MeV in case of molybdenum 100. And all this kind of work is done in extremely low background uh, condition. So I will start from cupid molybdenum, which uh, has born thanks to the successfully test that we did in the framework of Lumino, which was a French uh, uh, project funded by INR. And we did several tests with natural and rich crystal, both in Modan and in Gran Sasso. The source uh, is molybdenum 100, and the detector is lithium molybdate. So this uh, here you can appreciate the crystal in which eventually we have the neutrino double beta decay that will occur with the uh, your entity thermistor, and then here you can see the germanium wafer that works uh, as an auxiliary bolometer to read in coincidence the heat and the light. And uh, you have seen uh, here, also you see, you have seen this uh, morning from bread, the pulses, this is so what I mean, when you read in coincidence, again, you have here your crystal, you have the deposition of the energy, you register the heat, and in coincidence, you are able to read out the light, and thanks to this double readout, we are able to reject completely the alpha from the surface. Uh, Cupid molybdenum was installed at the underground laboratory of Modan between Italy and France. We have shared the Edelweiss cryogenic infrastructure, so half of the cryostat was devoted to dark matter and the other half to neutrino less double beta decay. We have installed 20 lithium molybdate detector of uh, about 200 gram each. Uh, each the main crystal was read with a uh, germanium entity based sensor for the light collection. And the physics uh, data taking was between March 2019 and 20, uh, June 2020. Here I put uh, a gallery of pictures of Cupid molybdenum. So this is what you need. Uh, you see it's uh, rather simple for uh, one single module, the crystal, the light detector, the copper holder, screw and Teflon pieces for the thermal link. You do this uh, 20 times, you assemble everything in five towers, you put in your cryostat, you close, and also we, have, uh, we were obliged to uh, use some uh, spring uh, decoupled system, uh, we called it a suspended tower to get rid of uh, the vibration induced by pulse tube uh, of the cryostat. If we go to the performance, you see that the choice of lithium molybdate has really matched all the criteria that I have shown you before. So First of all, high energy resolution. We have uh, 7 kV at the Q beta beta value for uh, molybdenum. Then you see that uh, if we make the scatter plot, so this is uh, a real scatter plot obtained in, uh, in Modan, you have the light as a function of the heat, and you see that you are able to disentangle the alpha ba band from the beta in which you expect your signal. And here is the position in which we expect the neutrino is double beta decay peak, and you see that we, thanks to this uh, double readout, we get rid of uh, uh, any counts in the background region. Also, for, from uh, what concerns the crystallization, we have obtained excellent crystal radio purity, less than one uh, microbecquerel per kilogram, both for uranium and thorium chain, which is, uh, it, it was really a big challenge that we have achieved. 
And then we have also been able to set the most precise and two neutrinos double beta decay measurement for molybdenum 100. And if we go to physics uh, for a while, here you see the background, the spectrum that we obtain, and putting together all the different cuts again, you see that uh, in the region of interest we have zero background. And what I would like to underline here is that with the really 20 crystals, so not a big mass, uh, and with such a small exposure, two kilograms per year, it was possible to, to set the most stringent worldwide limit of neutrino -less double beta decay of molybdenum 100. So Cupid molybdenum was uh, thought to be a first demonstrator of this technique in view of Cupid, but at the end, we succeed to, to be competitive uh, with the uh, neutrino -less double beta decay physics. So this is important and proves the, uh, the powerful of this uh, technique. So as I was uh, saying, Cupid molybdenum has been a successful story because Cupid uh, uh, will use lithium molybdate crystals, so the Cupid molybdenum te technology will be scaled up in the quarter cryostat and uh, merging together the, experi the experience that we got from uh, running quarter plus the Cupid molybdenum technology we will go into the Cupid direction, will be one of the most uh, promising next generation neutrino less double beta decay experiment. So now I will move to CROSS, which is uh, less known uh, by in the field. So CROSS is uh, again another ERC project that is a demonstrator that will be installed in Camp Franc underground laboratory, so between Spain and France, for a new double beta decay technology with detector capable of rejecting surface events, so both alpha and beta. So just to remind you that with scintillating bolometers, we can only reject, uh, it's already a great improvement compared to Quare, but thanks to CROSS, we will be able to reject both alpha and betas from uh, surface. The main compound will be lithium molybdate, as in Cupid uh, molybdenum, and there will be also a small section with tellurium dioxide. Here, uh, we will exploit the solid state physics uh, at low uh, temperature. Each crystal will be covered by a film that is uh, a metal, both in the normal or superconducting, so we will get rid completely of the extra light channels. We will just have one heat channel obtained with the NTD readout. What happens is that if you have an event close the surface uh, and you have this kind of uh, metallic film, you have the high energy phonons that are generated, you have the trapping of out equilibrium phonons for uh, surface events uh, in the metal. And so at the end, uh, what happens is that you have a fast energy degradation into the metal. And so this accelerates the thermal process. And that's why the film uh, works as a pulse shape modifier for surface events. Uh, and uh, it came out that these events have a shorter rise time than the bulk event. And that's why we can. Uh, discriminate surface from uh, bulk events. We did a lot of R&D with small sample of uh, crystal and at the end the best coating material was a bilayer of aluminum palladium that has been selected. And this was the best compromise between the efficient thermalization of surface events, the low specific heat and the easy deposition by evaporation. Here you can see what happened when, uh, so the discrimination as I, as I told you before it's on the shape of uh, the signal, not uh, on the light uh, emission. So here we have a pulse shape parameter as a function of the deposited energy, and you can see with the pure palladium film that uh, in blue we were able to see bulk events uh, disentangled from both alpha and beta here in red. If you make the same uh, plot uh, with the light, uh, as a function of the energy, you see that it was not possible to discriminate the beta. While with thanks to this pulse shape modification obtained, now we can uh, discriminate also betas from the surface. And this will be an improvement again for a possible next stage of Cupid when, uh, because when you face a background then you, you go after, but then another background came immediately next. So it's important to go on uh, with this type of uh, research and R&D and instrumentation. So we have also validated uh, the fact that we were able to reject efficiently betas with uh, Monte Carlo and it was possible to reconstruct the spectrum. So we were really sure that 
what was discriminated was uh, beta coming from the surface. And this is, I think, a main uh, breakthrough in bolometric double beta decay search. And now we are working to transfer the technology to final size uh, crystal. So now I will uh, spend the last uh, few minutes on bingo that uh, looks uh, for the future. So again, the aim is to reduce uh, by another uh, order of magnitude uh, the background. Again, the isotopes will be molybden 100 and tellurium 130, embedding in our best uh, candidate uh, in terms of uh, crystal. The alpha rejection will be done by heat and light. We will have again NTD readout uh, and the same electronics of the quarter and cupid molybdenum solution. And the idea is to have a B isotope approach because it will be a more option for next to next generation experiment. And the observation eventually in two candidates from one side will give you the discovery, but also the confirmation of your signal, which will be the innovative elements in bingo. So the first aim is to reduce a further order of magnitude to the background level of cupid. So this is more in view of a cupid one tone. There will be three uh, main uh, tool that we will adopt. So the first one is a revolutionary assembly of the detectors in order to kill the surface radioactivity. So I have appreciate what uh, Professor Stefanini said the first day, saying that you need to have a lot of imagination. So I think here the imagination is that the crystals are kept with nylon wire. So you minimize the material, the passive material that generates surface contamination, and you use this simple nylon wire to keep at cryogenic temperature crystals. So we have done uh, already some tests above ground, and we have seen excellent properties in uh, this kind of detector. So now we will move to underground to validate uh, the technology. Second, uh, for the first time, we will have a full active shield inside the experimental space. This will be mainly to kill external gamma background, so we will have scintillators surrounding the experimental space, so it will be at 10 millik, and the idea is to use either BGO or zinc tank state crystal. These scintillators will be not read as uh, a thermal uh, bolometers, we just read the light output, and thanks to coincidence, we will kill the gamma background. Again, uh, there is a prototype that has been already assembled. You can see here the BGO crystal. You maybe see the germanium wafers for the light uh, collection, and uh, we will uh, test in the next uh, few weeks uh, in France this first uh, prototype. And then the last part will be innovative light detector based on neganov luke effect, and this will be used in case of the lurent dioxide, in which you will tag the Cherenkov light, and then also to read out uh, this uh, bar, scintillating bar. And here I put one result that you obtained some years ago, again in Modan, in which using the uh, germanium uh, light detectors, uh, in which you can see again the circular electrodes, like the one that I've shown you on the Edelweiss crystal, it was possible to discriminate uh, the weak emission of the Cherenkov light uh, into a tellurium dioxide crystal. Here you see when there is no uh, amplification, so zero volt on the electrodes, everything is on the same line, so you are not able to reject gamma and alpha. As soon as you apply 60 volts on the electrodes, you start to have these two bands, and uh, these allow you the discrimination between uh, alpha coming from the Cherenkov, uh, uh, sorry, the beta com coming from the Cherenkov. So, in conclusion, I hope to have convinced you that bolometers are nowadays a well-established particle detection technique with different type of phonon sensors that can be chosen on the basis of the experimental needs. In addition to phonons, there are other excitation that can be measured, like charge, scintillation, light, and you can also enhance your sensitivity using the mediation of phonon in the Luke effect devices. Bolometers have also attractive feature for their events experiment as the search for, la for uh, dark matter candidates and the neutrino less double beta decay. And this, this is a technology that is compatible with low radioactivity background thanks to material radiopurity and particle impact point identification. So thanks a lot. I would like also to thank all the colleagues that I have met in these uh, 14 years of uh, activity. So engineer, technician, students that make all this uh, work possible. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Claudia, for this uh, uh, very nice and uh, deep presentation on uh, bolometers. Questions or comments? One over there. Over there. Yeah, thank you also from my side for this excellent presentation. Could you do me the favor to make a comparison and sensitivity with the pure germanium uh, uh, the zero neutrino beta decays, double beta decay like Gerda, which in my opinion is setting the stage at the moment, is this true? Or what is the lithium molybdenum based scintillators? The difference, uh, uh, you mean? The the in terms of sensitivity, how do they I compare? think that both uh, Legend and uh, Cupid are on the same uh, level for sensitivity. The, the main advantage of Cupid is that uh, the technology is there. So if... No, I mean uh, Gerda, for instance. Yeah, Gerda. So Gerda can be... You can compare Gerda to Quarry, which is running now. So there, these are the today generation experiment. Then there will be the next upgrade that brings to Legend or Cupid. So the phase space is better if you, if you look into the signal for neutrino less double beta decays and you took the formula, the phase space is better for molybdenum than for the germanium. So this is uh, a bonus that uh, we have from the theoretical phenomenological point of view. Then the technique uh, in terms of energy resolution, uh, uh, intrinsically low radioactivity, I think it's uh, almost equivalent for uh, both Thank the you. type of experiment. Thank you. A question here. Thank you so much for uh, this very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, I wish you to comment on a spe specific issue. So uh, I was wondering if, uh, if you had to detect uh, chargeless mode in general. So for instance, uh, Majorana fermions or parafermions in general, some exotic uh, states, okay? So uh, uh, your techniques uh, could be useful to detect these uh, such chargeless modes or, or not? So I, I, I am very interested in uh, what you envision. So I'm not an expert of this kind of uh, physics, but uh, once you have a release of the energy, it depends if you need to... Tr for the, the drawback of bolometers is that you are sensitive to the full energy that is deposited. You cannot distinguish the particle that is impinging unless you use this double readout. So it depends on the energy that is released, then I think that uh, you can, uh, as you see, there is a lot of versatility, so you can choose uh, the sensor, the absorber, and maybe there is one that is suitable for this kind of search. But, uh, we can okay. maybe discuss Thank it. you. Yeah, thank you. Actually, Francesco Giazzotto is clearly from, from another field and is asking questions that we don't uh, know how to <laughs> answer often. And so that, that's a very good way of uh, you Extend, know, yeah. talking to each other and maybe uh, learn from, from each other. Other yeah. questions or comments? I don't see any. So thank you very much again, Claudia. And uh, we will move now to the uh, session dedicated to the uh, Mencione Prize Award. And uh, I think uh, Angelo Scribano will uh, uh, introduce uh, this award that the Frontier Detectors for Frontier Physics uh, Association created a few years ago. Presentation? Quill, eh? Okay. Uh, this, one. this one, maybe. Come funziona questo qui e questo qui avanti? Quello quello è il base, quello che c'è avanti. Questo avanti dietro. Questo è là. Okay, good morning. This, I believe, is the most important event, at least for me and for my colleagues, in the PISA meeting live. Okay? Uh, let me start now. So in December 2012, we lost a colleague, a scientist, an inventor, a founder of the PISA meeting since 1980, if I remember correctly, a friend in total 
So this is uh, Aldo, was Aldo Menzione, years. So in uh, December 2014, the executive board of the Association of Frontier Detectors for Frontier Physics uh, decided Corally, the institution of the Aldo Menzione Prize. The prize is uh, awarded uh, in coincidence uh, of which is a meeting to colleagues distinguished uh, who have contributed uh, not only to development detector techniques, but also hard and soft application in physics uh, with outstanding uh, achievements. But uh, before to proceed, uh, I will ask uh, Giorgio Bellettini, who is here, who will give us uh, his personal memory of Aldo. Please, Giorgio. In effect, from uh, 1980, 42 years uh, as passed uh, <laughs> through Giorgio. So, questo qui per andare avanti. Sì. Vuoi il, il pointer? Vuoi il pointer? Il pointer è questo. Ah, okay. vedete questo. Questo ti metto l'archetto che è più comodo. Perché no? Sì, sì. Okay, good morning. Uh, let's make sure that you understand me well, do you? Yeah. Think so? Well, Aldo was really a good old friend for me. Uh, he died nine years, ten years ago, and he was nine years younger than me. And it is not so new for me, when well, I'm becoming very old now, to happen to say memories about friends who died and were when they were younger than me. And this is, in fact, uh, something which makes me uneasy. But it's a pleasure, in a way, to be able to remember directly them from what they did together with me. He did not, he was not my student. He got his laurea. I don't remember who his, was his supervisor, but certainly he was in Karlsruhe in 1970, working on his PhD. He was happy so so, but uh, I was leading a group of Pisa and Frascati to build, in fact, actually the, four, the, 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 the first uh, experiment at the ISR. And uh, Lorenzo Foja was actually one of the leaders of the group. Uh, one day approached me and said, Aldo is very intelligent but a little messy. This is very true. Uh, he's my cousin, married my sister. Would you take him with me, with us? Then that, of course, the, the presentation that he was clever and uh, uh, very intelligent was, 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 was important information. The rest did not really matter for me. All the others are minor things which had no, no, no role in this event. So he, he became immediately a group member, and that was, was a big acquisition. He was very intelligent, indeed. Uh, the uh, four pi detector R81 at the ASR uh, was uh, an assembly of plain scintillation counters split into bins of solid angle, which is polar and theta, of course. And uh, we, tra we tried to catch, oh, sorry. We tried to catch uh, all the interactions. This was uh, hiding the, the crossing point of the two beams at the ISR. That was a collider with two separate beams. And uh, there are counters in, the, in one forward and another forward direction and uh, uh, of a central box. The idea was to, to catch all the events, some tracks at, at least, but certainly all the events, and uh, to measure thereby the total cross-section. 
And Hargo was a true experimentalist, worked hard with the technicians to build this detector. Uh, just an idea of how the counters were arranged, because it matters for what I, I'm going to say next. Uh, a central box of uh, bins, of plastic bins, very four detectors in, to catch the elastic scattering or quasi, quasi elastic scattering, and two four cones split into smaller and smaller bins to get to around the this uh, uh, the beam direction, around the beam, uh, the, the two beams. This is a particular thing that Aldo loved to, to, to check because he didn't want to leave any hole to, to allow particles to, to escape the detection. To, we wanted to minimize the number of lost tracks, which was important in order to work out the total cross-section. And uh, in fact, uh, what we expected at that time uh, was that uh, the total the cross-section of all the other algae processes would come down to a constant with increasing energy. This is the equivalent laboratory energy, which is just below the, the effective energy of the ISR colliding beams. And uh, so this was several expectations of the theorists, but all in all, we expected, with no reason, but it was just a ba based on fact, we expected that the cross-section would become constant. And in fact, this was the result. This was the result. And uh, uh, the cross-section grew significantly all along the ASR energy range. And the, incidentally, this, the reason for this effect uh, is not clear. Fundamental reason. Of course, we know processes we start and the cross-sections which grow in various exclusive channels, but the reason why they, this should be a turnaround point and they would grow in total that much. So that was the first discovery of the ASR. One thing that Aldo liked very much was to show how the, the data behaved at the very small angles around the beams. So what he did, and he came out <laughs> with a surprise to us, actually. Uh, we came out in a group meeting suddenly to showing this picture, which was very uh, popular. And in fact, it was one cover of the, uh, the cover of one issue of the same courier, with changing the number of uh, tracks in the four accounts, five here, six, seven, after having removed uh, the leading particle. He wanted to show where, to understand where the fragments would go. So we, let's remove the primary, and for the fragments, work out where they are, this is the average pseudo rapidity of the bunch, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the multiplicity. So this, you see that there is a bunch of, of fragments grouping around the primaries, the scattered the scatter final state primaries on the two sides. And the effect was clear for a number of multiplicities up to seven, eight, when with the multiplicity, this phenomenon disappears and normal uh, production uh, came, uh, came over. These, these, uh, these funny pumps, in fact, which were a visual, a visual uh, presentation of what the fraction is, were called pooper in Italian style at CERN, and they were celebrated on the front page of the CERN career. Aldo went through a long period at CERN on 801, on, uh, on, uh, on the FRAM experiment to measure for the production of charmed hadrons, but after a while, uh, we had where we are starting a new experiment, an experiment again on a collider, the Teveton proton anti proton collider in the US. And he joined us again. And it so happens that uh, we, uh, we designed a detector which was a calorimetrized version of R801. All angles were covered in polar angle beams by a central box, by two four spectrometers except that this time we had uh, a magnetic field here and we have in the bins we have energy measurement in calorimeter towers which was a great progress of course and this is a, a show on how the towers in the central calorimeter were split and lots of work both in in uh, building the, the towers building the towers in frascati assembling them 
And then when you get out the signals directly from the towers, you see the jacks. There they are, they come up. They are not single tracks, but still they are very well defined around the axis. So a straight picture of the jets was provided by these calorimeters, which was useful for the analysis as well. I remember because the size of the detector is the area that you have to close, and the wider area is, the more likely it is to catch, to catch the background, of course. Uh, this is a picture in which we see Aldo working somewhere in here, uh, setting up one tower of one of these wedges, 48 wedges in here. Another imagination uh, of Aldo, who was a, strenu a, str a strenuous sponsor of the silicon detectors in CDF, was a design which is just hand drawn, uh, appeared in public, but it was hand drawn, of a number of st stations inside the Teverdon beams uh, with the polar and polar and azimuthal, sorry, polar and azimuthal uh, sectors measuring the, the, uh, the direction, the, the trajectory of the charged particles. Uh, this, this was a design, a, a drawing as old as the original design report of 1981 of CDF. In practice, of course, the difference, uh, it was realized different with plain slabs of material and, uh, and the electrodes were ex up and down. But of course, the principle is this one. And in, in that design, there is the entire fantasy of Aldo. He likes really to, to put down something which occurred to the fantasy. Now, the main goal of the experiment was to discover the top quark. Uh, the main production of the, of the Tevatron was pair production of TT bar through an exchange of a gluon, and they would decay weekly in W and beauty. So at the very end, you get a lot, not, not many final state vectors. The two tops are here, each one of them gives you a B jet, and then on the, on the rest, and, the, and the rest is defined on how the two Ws would decay. So it is a complicated six-body final state, but always uh, shows two B jets, and the B jets, of course, they decay in general, including a, a long, a long late time, relatively long late time, hadron which decays away from the primary vertex. So if you have, this is a primary vertex, these are jets which are seen mostly in the calorimeter. This is deduced by missing transverse momentum. But there are two jets here, number one and four, which among the various tracks, they include tracks which appear to come from a vertex which is not the primary one. And these are a few millimeters, three or four, two here. So with this detector, you could be able to to uh, trace events like this. In fact, uh, the most important idea was Aldo's insistence uh, to track the secondary vertices, which must be there in top, in 2B decays, uh, with cylinders of silicons around the interaction points. This is a sketch of a silicon detector in which you see a number of layers. We, we can imagine a number of layers. The, the sectors uh, in the Azimuthal sectors and uh, which co was called the silicon vertex detector. Uh, that was the original design which appeared in print in 1981 in the original design report of CDF1, uh, which you see very well the, all the ideas of the mini vertex. Uh, this is half of the, uh, of that, the vertex detector, which was rescued in, at the end of the run one of, uh, of run one in 1988. We built a bigger one and, uh, with more layers and higher resolution for the second run of the Teodron, but that was split into two part. parts. One is left in the US, one is in Pisa, in our, in our archives. So why, do you, why do, did we decide to assign these prices? Well, first of all, we wanted to acknowledge Aldo's history. He, wa he was still very young when he died. He could have been more productive. But he was very enthusiastic and still very productive during his life. He was very original and a creative experimentalist. The idea is that we want to inspire young scientists to recognize the merits of your senior colleagues who are prizing today and to excite them to get to the same goals, to follow his example and devise 
frontier detectors for frontier physics. The future is in their hands. So please, don't forget that your past, past uh, let's say, colleagues have done quite a job. There's much more to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giorgio. So. so before uh, to go to the winners of this year, I would like to spend a few words for the selection procedure that uh, we have uh, in, the, in our association. Just a few words. Uh, just for the transparency, I mean. Uh, a search committee is appointed by the uh, executive board of the association in order to select a research field and to identify possible candidates in that field. It takes uh, some time, a few months, I mean, just uh, up to the committee to elaborate, uh, to identify the the, not all the candidates, but also the research field. Afterwards, the final decision is taken during a plenary session of the General Assembly of the Association. Association is uh, about 20 people, so no more than that, but always uh, a certain number of people. So, uh, the first edition was in 2015 during the 13th PISA meeting on advanced detectors. At that time, Dave Nigren and Fabio Sauli, they got the prize. And maybe, maybe, yes, I have a picture of that time. Uh, Afterwards, 14 PISA meeting on advanced detectors. Second edition, 2018. Uh, Marcello Giorgio and Carl Haber were the winners of the prize. Uh, let me see, these are the plates. And there should be a picture also. Ah, we have also the uh, president of ANFN uh, giving the prize at that time. I didn't remember that, okay. We have a tradition, Donata Foa, Bikina for the friends, is the wife of Ardo. Normally she delivers the commemorative plates to the winners. Bikina, please, she is here. Prego. And Francesco, you stay here also. And uh, now we go, let's see. Oh, René Bren and Pantaleo Raimondi. René for the Poe and Root, who doesn't know that? Fundamental tools for experimental data handling. And Pantaleo Raimondi for the Crab Waste, Everybody knows that. Crucial tool for micro beans in a plus and minus colliders. Slack knows, Frascati knows, every in the world knows Pantaleo. Please, Pantaleo, please, René. Hello. Or maybe, or maybe also here. <laughs> okay, uh, but maybe secretary gave me something, but I don't know what, but let, let me see if it's the right. Uh, 
Oh yes. This is for you, René. And this is for you, Pantaleo. Thank you. I believe you won't say it. Take off the yeah, maybe, yeah. Yes, You're right. Yeah. For the yes. Well, I would like to thank very much the organizing committee and uh, the people who decided to give me this prize, which was totally unexpected for me. I am retired now since 10 years, but I've always been working on very controversial projects, including the one I am working now <laughs> on <laughs> physics modeling. And the developments of Po, uh, Jean, and Root, I was involved in the, the Jean 1, Jean 2, and Jean 3 that became Jean 4 also later on. And these have been, you know, very controversial projects at the beginning. And uh, as I say, you know, in Chinese, the word crisis means uh, uh, opportunity. Mm? And uh, I have always find uh, the, you know, the, the fact that when you discuss things, you get in crisis, uh, providing you stay, you know, a gentleman, uh, it was always a progress. Okay. So this was essentially my message. So I would like to really thank very much again the organizing committee. And I would like to mention also that I have to pass a message to the many people who have been collaborating with me in the past because there are many, many people, uh, you know, since uh, basically 50 years when I start working at the ISR with Carlo Rubia and so on. Voilà. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, René. Thank you. And thank you. So, first of all, I must say that uh, I'm not uh, really expert uh, in building uh, detectors, but uh, I'm, uh, I know very well uh, how to waste them. So <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, on, uh, on the other hand, through all uh, my career and uh, together with uh, all uh, uh, my colleagues that uh, work in uh, building and operating accelerators, we have uh, all the time done uh, our best effort uh, in order to provide the detectors with uh, useful uh, events uh, and data and not uh, swamp them uh, with uh, radiation. And uh, I think uh, the selection committee has uh, recognized uh, this effort that uh, at times uh, it was somewhat successful, uh, I must say. So, and uh, I think we will uh, continue this uh, effort uh, uh, all the time uh, and this uh, wonderful collaboration uh, between uh, uh, all the physicists that participate uh, in uh, discovering uh, and uh, unveiling uh, all the secrets of the universe. So, and uh, again, I thank you uh, all uh, and the committee and I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. Okay. I have just to say there was a real pleasure for us during the discussion in the past months to select their names, really. Eh? But yes. Yes. Bikina. Yeah, before letting Bikina close, I, I want to just say uh, in the past editions of, the, of this award, we selected detector builders. And in this, uh, this time, we actually selected uh, people who are essential, who are not detector builders, as you pointed out, but who build things that are absolutely essential to do physics. And we wanted to you know, give a, you know, full recognition of the importance of accelerator and all the you know, software to really do the physics that we need. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Well, just two words to conclude this event. Uh, I'm, it's always a great pleasure to be here, and this is the third time that I'm here to award the Aldous Prize to two very important physicists. <laughs> so it's a good, especially in this magic place, because, uh, and I want also to, to thank, of course, all the staff of the organization meeting, uh, and you all, because to be here, let me remember that uh, this is one of the places that Aldo liked most. And uh, usually it, it was possible to see him here smiling, which is not as very often, <laughs> very <laughs> frequent <laughs> things. So um, the reason of enjoying this place, of course, are several, are many, and 
first, of course, is the high level of the conference of the physics and the physicist. But then also the, the chance to find the old friends. And then, uh, last but not least, the food. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, thank you all, and in his name. Okay, thank you, Bettina. Thank you to everybody. Maybe I have something else. No, I don't know. Yes, thank you, Aldo. Okay? Okay. So we reconvene at 3.30 as uh, usual uh, for the afternoon session. <laughs>